for the Nikki and Dr. Nick show. We forget how we were going to say it, but we're going to come up with some different names for it. So if anybody has seen a show called The Simpsons, that's how I usually start all of my seminars. And there's a character on there called Dr. Nick. So I'll go ahead and start off with Dr. Nick's intro statement, which is, hi, everybody. And then everybody says back, hi, Dr. Nick. And if this was a live class, you'd all have your arms in the air. Hi, Dr. Nick. And all excited. But I have to just pretend that all of you are doing that with us here today. So there is a Q&A where you can put information in there if you'd like to. I see that we're a smaller group. Oh, I do get it. Amanda Bach is here. All right. Hi, Dr. Nick. Glad that you are here, Miss Amanda. And Amanda did a fantastic seminar with us back in Calgary uh, earlier this year on an instrument assisted technique class. And she'll be doing another one in September. So it's great to hear that you are here. So if you do have questions, please let me know as we go through. I'll do my best to facilitate those. You can also put information in the chat as well. And we can see that on the side of our screen. But I find that all educational opportunities work better when people ask questions. So the more questions you ask, the better this process will be. Generally a little more interactive when we have people in person, but still we can do a pretty good job here. The layout of today's course is going to be, we're gonna start with a movement therapy flow. And I'll generally talk through some of it a little bit and I'll say why I like to use this technique or method in practice. And then we'll go through that full flow for about an hour. Then I'm gonna break down some poses with the help of the amazing Nikki here behind us that you can see. And we will go through the yoga book and kind of talk about some of the key content right there. So all of this content is available on our yoga book. We are also going to be doing a yoga movement therapy retreat in Hawaii for February, 2023. So early on, if you want to get into that, Amanda, I think you're probably going to be there. So that'll be fantastic. And uh, just so everybody's clear on the reference where this information is coming from, I'm just going to do a quick screen share so we can see that. And if I click onto here, oof, you can see all my background information, but I am getting all this information from the yoga book that myself and Dr. Land and a number of people have written uh, probably about three years ago, actually. But it's designed to take you through yoga movements and anatomy, and we're always looking for feedback and additions to it. So again, the amazing Nikki is going to help us out with a lot of that stuff. But you can see the basic process that we're going through here is written on the very first page, foundations to create balance in a, in a stable base to move from alignment to create orientation of mechanical and physical and emotional structure to actually get through it and then fully express that position as much as possible. So I try and use this in my practice quite a bit, both my yoga practice and clinical practice with patients. And I find it's a good way to balance this information with people. Uh, the layout with this book basically is talking about each individual position that you would go into looking at indications, contraindications, the anatomy that we're using as we go through it, and looking at variations and adjustments. And I'm going to stop the screen share for just one second, because I think it's really important for us to see each other for doing this, is a lot of people think you have to be like, like the amazing Nikki back here, who can basically bend herself into a pretzel and has really good flexibility. How long have you been practicing yoga for? 36 years. 36 years. So she started when she was five. Oh, I thought you started when, okay, when she was minus five, because I was going to say, I was going to give your age. I was going to say, she's obviously 30 old right now. So she started in the womb when she was still an, an egg actually forming. Okay. But you guys know what I'm trying to say is, oh, Diane, Diane, you're here too, saying Hawaii was great. I hope we can see you out there again in the chat. Fantastic. But the point I'm trying to make is as a middle-aged male, I am usually not considered the typical aspect of what a yoga therapy practice is going to look like but it is really for every person to try and experience. And I would encourage this. I do this with my 90 year old patients and with my kids, however I can get them to move better. I know we're gonna see better outcomes for them. So don't think this has to be the Lululemon poster where you look like you're the perfect model for this kind of stuff, right? So I would really stress that for a lot of people. I can see we have substantially less people than we had in the uh, morning session. But the issue for this is yoga is really for everybody. Anybody can use it. Anybody can benefit from it. You can make a practice as easy or hard as you want it to be, depending on the specific level of the person that you're actually working with on that day. So I'm going to go back to my screen share here really quick. So back to what we're seeing for that content inside the book that we're going to be working through. You should also get a reduced rate on this one today as well, is going to be the adjustments and variations for more flexibility or less flexibility. So all of those are going to be key. And then I talk about the evidence for yoga here really quick as we're going through. So yoga is proven. And then there are literally hundreds of articles that support this to improve flexibility, increased balance, 
improve strength, which a lot of people don't think, I would suggest to you, you can improve strength in every aspect of your body with the exception of flexion of the arms, because it's pretty much the only action you don't really see a good power movement in yoga, but you can get around that with partner yogas and positions and other things like that, that will show you different asanas we can follow. All right, so you're gonna decrease stress and anxiety levels. Absolutely is going to be key. One of the major themes that we all use in our practices already is going to be breathing techniques and focusing on that breath can drastically reduce stress, and anxiety. We're seeing research articles here, lowering heart, uh, heart or improving heart health, lowering inflammatory risks. Research suggests that yoga may protect against cardiac diseases and chronic inflammatory conditions improving sleep and overall quality of life. And I'm not just giving like one or two references and cherry picking this. This is like five or six different articles that we quote for improving sleep. One of my favorite things happened last week when one of my, my youngest daughter was all ready for bed. She already had her jumpsuit on and all this kind of stuff. Her little, she has this little kangaroo suit that she likes. And I'll stop the screen share for this for a second. It's a little kangaroo suit that, suit that she likes to wear all the time. Her favorite animal is kangaroo. So she was jumping around like a kangaroo. And we're just about going for bed. And she's like, dad, can we use some yoga before bed? I'm like, yes, absolutely. We can do that. And she's like, okay, dad, I have to go get changed. She has to go get changed into her yoga outfit. And I had her, she's at seven years old, already starting to teach a class and walk me through it. If you're not following me on Instagram, you would have seen it there as well. You can also find Nikki. What's your Instagram? Um, uh, International Yoga Network. Okay, International I'm Yoga there Network. With Instagram. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. We're yeah, building... He's making fun of me, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah. So, basically, anybody can do this at any time. So, that'll be another key thing for us to understand. Okay. And then also, even weight loss, reducing chronic pain. We know that we're dealing with a lot of patients in chronic pain. We can make a big difference for people with this chronic pain issues. All right. So, I just wanted to discuss that. Yoga history, that'll be for a different day. We talk about that in our yoga teacher trainings, different yoga styles. Nikki really is much more of an expert. The yamas and niyamas are all good. Breathing apparatus, I'm not going to spend too much time on. I really kind of wanted to just start there and then get us into our, I'm just going to skip ahead here a little bit. There's a lot of good information here, but this main focus will be for all of us in our application for daily living on our patients. Now, one of the key things that we should realize is how much are people, or how much are people actually moving throughout a day? So human ADLs, activity of daily living, you're spending on average, and this is for North America from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and National Institute of Health in the U.S., as everybody who's followed me at any time knows, I definitely like to have good evidence-informed basis for the facts that I'm bringing up. You are sitting for about 10 to 12 hours a day. That's at work, that's driving in your vehicle, that is at home when you're watching TV in the evening. Then you are sleeping for six to eight hours a day and you are laying down on your couch or on your bed. So you're only really up and moving for maybe about four, three or four hours a day on average. And for most of North America, it's even less than that. If we look at the number four cause of mortality in the world from the World Health Organization, it is sedentary lifestyle. One of the best things that we can do for our patients is try and expose them to more movement therapies. Our massage and manual techniques and joint mobilizations and all of that are great, but nothing will offer them the same benefit as number one, education, and then number two, getting them to use and move their body a little bit more. And I'll go through and talk more about that. All this basic stuff would be if you hadn't seen anatomy before, this walks you through some of the basics of anatomy and osteoarthritis. And I should maybe bring that point up again. Osteoarthritis, one of the most common conditions you will see. If you're looking at these images right here, you can prevent or decrease the acceleration of osteoarthritis with a good yoga practice. If somebody tells you they have bad knees, bad shoulders, there are going to be so many variations and options that you can choose that still promote good joint range of motion and can facilitate optimal health in those tissues that you can find a way to make it work for them. The last time we were in Hawaii, I was at uh, Home Depot buying some equipment that we needed for the actual seminar series. And one of the, one of the uh, cashiers was, I have bad knees. I can't do yoga. I'm like, okay, let me see your bad knees. I took her out from around behind there. She was about 70 years old, still working at Home Depot. And she said she just enjoyed it. So that's why she was doing it. She showed me a squat where she could kind of get halfway down. And that was as far as she could go. All I literally had to do was hold her hands and take about 20%, 20 pounds of her body weight off and let her squat down again. And she actually got into a deep squat. 
She hadn't done that, she said, in decades. And it was just a little interaction like that that created more range of motion for her. So just finding ways to help people explore that action. And joint health, as we know, because joints inside do not have any direct blood supply, you have to move the joints to have them be healthy. The synovial fluid is where you're exchanging the joint and soft tissue stuff, right? All right, and all the range of motion stuff, not a big deal. All the muscle stuff, I'm just gonna fade ahead here just a little bit. We're gonna start the practice up in just a second, but pain science, we can talk a little about that. Sets and reps, not a big deal. All right, viscera and yoga, posture variations. We are gonna come into this one later on. Okay, so I'm gonna stop the screen share, check for questions here really quick. And all I get the one is from Amanda and we're gonna start ourselves into a little bit of a flow. So you may or may not hear the music in the background. I'll turn it up just a little bit. It's gonna be relatively light. This would be a nice simple flow that we can go ahead and do. Nikki may show some variations as we're going through this as well. And I'm just gonna have us starting in a nice standing position just to begin with, okay? So a couple of key things here in these standing positions. Oh, you know what, Nikki, this is gonna look so good. I think I'm gonna record this as a, on the phone here as well as a hyperlapse, one of these. So just give me two seconds. If somebody wants, they can give me a chat, just a shout out in the background. Can you actually hear the background music or not? Diane, if you're there, maybe you can tell me. I wanna make sure it's loud enough for you guys to hear, but not overpowering. Okay. Slightly, yeah, that's all I'm looking for is just slightly hearing the music. If you have your own music that you'd prefer to listen to here, yeah, okay, some of you can't hear it. So you might want to pick some relaxing flow music that you could pick for yourself because it may not be loud enough with all the different mic setups that we have. All right. So we're going to find ourselves standing in a nice relaxed position. And even before we even begin, just even take a couple of steps and just walk out your legs a little bit. You can just bend your knees if you want. You can actually lift your hands off the ground. Take a couple of breaths in and then breathing out. And I can see, I just want to move my camera just a little bit so we can catch a bit more of this. All right, so we're going to start finding ourselves, hands are turned outward into external rotation, nice and neutral. Shoulders are gonna be relaxed and back and down a little bit. And we're just gonna focus on some breath. This will be Tadasana, mountain pose, getting people connecting with their breath in a standing position. Nice breath in, holding, and nice breath out. With each breath in, you should feel a little bit of elevation in your shoulders elevation through your spine. And then as you breathe out, the tension should drop away. So we're going to inhale to a count of three. And then we're going to exhale to a count of three. Inhaling again. In through the nose. Out through the mouth. You actually really want to hear the sound of your voice. Now, if we were doing more of an interactive style, you'd breathe in. And I would hear the, the dragon's breath of your voice letting it out. So from here, we're going to go ahead and cross both arms in front of our body just a little bit. We're going to inhale up nice and high and arms are going to swing out nice and wide. Excellent for shoulder range of motion. Exhaling, hands are coming down to heart center. Inhaling up one more time, same cycle. The hands come together and then exhaling. Back to heart center. Now we can keep our hands at heart center. Again, maybe just take your knees, flex them from side to side a little bit. And from here, we're gonna work on some neck movements. So just to start with, we're gonna do a nice big inhale. We're gonna exhale and lean our head to the side and try and push Pull your shoulder down and elongate through your neck as you lean to the side. Inhaling back up to center. And we're gonna exhale and lean the opposite direction. Inhaling back to center. Exhaling, 
opposite direction again. And with each movement, you should feel a little bit more elongation. Back to center, elongating opposite side. A little bit more range. This time we're gonna go back up to center. And now we're gonna bring our head to the opposite side, but we're gonna bring our nose towards our axilla. So kind of towards your armpit, leaning down. And then we're gonna come back up. And repeating opposite side, opposite axilla. Inhaling back to center. Exhaling chin to chest this time, so straight down. Inhaling back up and we're gonna look all the way up nice and high. And then exhaling back to center. Taking our hands now, one more big inhale all the way up and around, so hands come loose. Exhaling, and I'm gonna have you walk your feet out to the side just a little bit, and exhaling down into a nice deep squat if we can. So a nice deep squat, and we can slowly bring ourselves onto our glutes, sitting down, crisscross applesauce. So you have a couple of opportunities here to try different things. If you want, you can just be tight. If your hip flexors don't show that much range, I get some guys, especially in our jujitsu classes that get really stuck up like this, totally fine. Or you can work to getting your knees flatter towards the ground. When I first, when I first started doing yoga back in 1998, my knees were like stuck way up here. So you can make changes in tissue over time. And especially if you can do it yourself, Patients can respect that a lot better. Clients can respect that a lot better. All right, so from here, we've got our hands over top of our knees. You can pick whichever mudra you would like. You can be palms up, palms down, whatever works for you. And we're again gonna focus on that breathing. So as we breathe, we're gonna inhale and become a little bit taller. So the inhale is an elevation. And then the exhale, tension comes out of the shoulders, drops you down a little bit. Inhaling up. Exhaling, dropping that tension out. Now, I do a lot of flight, so I'll demo this from the side here a little bit. Something I'll even do when I'm flying is we're gonna do the nice inhale, even arch our backs back and looking up. Then we're gonna exhale and round our back right out, chin to chest if you can, and then all the way back up. Inhaling up. I call these seated cat cows. If you don't have a lot of range to move, exhaling down. This is a great way to loosen up your spine. I did a lot of pull-ups yesterday, so my middle back is tight. Inhaling up. And exhaling down. And you guys don't know how hard this is. Miss Nikki in the back here, her inhale takes forever. She has got lung capacity, okay? And then one more time, all the way up. All right, so then from here, we're going to start introducing some light spinal twisting. I wouldn't do an acute low back injury, but early on, it is something that you can do as long as it's not too painful and let pain always be the guide for this. If it's sharp, if it's shooting, that's too much for the person, but if they can tolerate it, you can definitely move into it a little bit more. So we're going to reach one hand behind our back. We're going to inhale the opposite hand up nice and high. Exhale, hand comes to the knee. And then we can twist ourselves into this position and just go to what's comfortable. You don't have to be able to look behind you. You could even just give a little bit of a twist and just looking over your shoulder, whatever availability you have, that's what we're shooting for. Now, the trick here is with each inhale, you get a little bit taller. So you actually arch your back upright a little bit more. And then we can exhale, maybe find a little bit more of that twist. Inhaling up, exhaling all the way around. And we'll keep in that position. We'll hold this for a few more breaths. But one of the common errors I see people do, especially if they're new to yoga, you can see here on the screen, they dump into their backs like this to try and twist. They really flex down. If you look at Nikki, she has excellent positioning. She's using blocks to maintain it. And even fingertips on the ground, whatever works for you, you kind of spin around. And then we're slowly gonna release, find ourselves back in neutral and repeat on the opposite side. Hand reaches behind. Inhaling, hand up nice and high. Exhaling, hand drops to knee. And then we'll go ahead and find that joyful discomfort. So exploring the range, making sure our shoulder isn't up around our ears. We're nice and relaxed and down. 
for me, because I've got a six foot four wingspan, you can see Nikki's got her, her fingers up like this. I'll just put my hands nice and flat to get my shoulders to drop down a little bit more. So inhaling up again, and then exhaling, finding a little bit more twist. Inhaling, and then exhaling. This feels fantastic on my back right now. One more time. Slowly going to come out of that. Back into our neutral seated position here. Our legs have been crisscrossed like this for a while. It'll feel a little bit weird, but it works towards ambidextrousness of the legs. Reverse, so the opposite leg is inside and the other leg is outside. Try and find balance and variation of movement here. If you notice for me on this way, I can actually get lower on my non-natural way to cross over. It's something I've been working on for a while, so we can increase our range that way. All right, so a couple of key things here, planting our hand at our side. We're gonna take the opposite hand, inhaling up nice and high, and we're gonna exhale and lean over to that planted hand side. And a couple of key things here. Number one, you should keep your contralateral hip anchored on the mat. What a lot of people will do is they'll start to try and reach for it and lift up their hip. It's not about how far you can reach. It's about how much flexibility and stretch you feel as you do it. And as long as you can breathe in that position. So inhaling up nice and high, exhaling, leaning a little bit further. Inhaling up a little bit again, walking that hand on the mat out, maybe just a little bit, exhaling, exploring that range. Inhaling up again. Exhaling, walking out a bit more if it's there. All the way out. So at 46, we're going to inhale and reverse to the opposite side. I compare myself to my peer group and what their flexibility actually is. And every year, because I maintain this practice, exhaling down, inhaling back up, walking the hand out, I can see that separation. Staying younger by maintaining flexibility, especially for a lot of men in particular, and most of our geriatric populations, inhaling up, exhaling down. The loss of flexibility is a major decrease in overall functional capacity. Inhaling back up to center. All right. So just some nice loosening of the spine. Take your shoulders, maybe walk them around a little bit. I'm a big fan of hamstring and adductor lengthening. So we'll do this here. So what I would like to do is take one leg, put it out nice and straight, keep the other leg bent. <laughs> and I will do this from the side here just a little bit so people can see what I'm doing. Okay, so again, it's not about how far you can reach. It's about finding that mobility a little bit. So if you want, if it's even difficult, some people you'll even start them back here. This can be enough movement for them just by leaning forward with their hands like this. But our goal is to keep our back relatively straight. We're gonna inhale up and don't let your back fold and just reach forward with your back relatively straight. And now I feel a stretch in my hamstrings, okay? And Miss Nikki's gonna show us a nice variation with a strap if you can't reach, which would be excellent. Or you can use a towel as well, inhaling up. Now we're gonna explore a little bit further. Maybe we reach down a little bit past the knee, exhaling down a little bit more. And now you can see the difference between especially what I commonly see in men and women. If you see me, I'm out of range in my hamstrings. If you look at Nikki in the background, she's able to keep her back straight and still find that range. There is no right way to do this. The right way to do it is what feels good in your body as long as it's not causing you any pain or discomfort. We're gonna inhale up a little bit more. It's a graded exposure, exhaling out, and then reaching to wherever you're comfortable. So for me, just again, long arms can really reach. I can go ahead and grab my foot. If that's there, great. If it's not, it doesn't matter. It's a matter of just finding what is a good range for you. Let your head dangle, rub against your microphone nonstop. All that stuff is helpful. And even hold this for breath. Now, while we're holding this for breath, I'm gonna make a couple of comments about what the research says, how we can load soft tissues. If you take and stretch a tissue, you can load it about three times and then you start reaching a point of diminishing returns. You don't get as much 
flexibility gain. You don't get as much change in the tissue elasticity. The process is called hysteresis, the slow mechanical change of tissue. But after three to five times, you've pretty much reached your maximum benefit. And slowly we're gonna release, bring ourselves right back up. And one of the ones that I like to do from here as well is going to be taking the opposite leg now, crossing it over top. So we're gonna get into our position like this. And then from here, one hand behind to stabilize. And if that's where you wanna stop, great. If this foot doesn't cross over, not a big deal. You can even just stay on the medial side here. But if you can, get it across to the opposite side. We're gonna inhale, hand up nice and high. Exhaling, hand, elbow, sorry, elbow to knee. And then we're slowly gonna give ourselves a little bit of a twist. This is a great stretch for the low back. We'll do variations in a prone and supine position here in a little bit, but a great way to start loosening up the low back. But a lot of people do this wrong. And the wrong way to do this, especially if I had chronic low back pain, would be to round my back out and really be fighting to get into that position. If you have to be in this position, you shouldn't be twisting so hard. You should maybe find yourself in a more relaxed and neutral, hey, can I even sit up like this? And if that's not available, put your hands down behind your back, decompress that spine, and all of these will offer you better mechanical advantage to give you better positioning for this. But we'll say we're able to progress through, progressing through to the elbow, hand can be up, hand behind, you inhale up, you exhale, and we reach and look behind us. Now, if you notice, my shoulder is jacked up right now because I've got this fingertip contact. I wanna put my hand flat for me and get that shoulder down a little bit and find a little more range that way. And again, typically holding these things for three breaths is gonna find some good benefit for you. I'm not sure if it's Nikki or what, but the temperature is getting warmer in here than it was this morning. So it's beautiful. All right. Yeah. yeah. And then we can slowly release. And now, for those of you who don't know me that well, Al loves me some babies. Okay. And did you know that you have a baby with you right now? In fact, this leg is your little baby right here. And what do you have to do when you see a baby? You have to support it by the neck. You have to support it by the foot as well. And you can pick that baby up and you can rock it from side to side. Okay. And what else do babies need? Babies need kisses. So you see your knee right there. That's the baby's head. Give that baby some kisses. Go. Give that baby some kisses. Nikki, I didn't hear your. Okay. She loves that baby. Have you loved your knees today? Right? So even look at the smile on your face right now. This adds a little bit of joy and a little bit of playfulness to the practice. So we can go from there, put that baby down gently. We can put both of our hands behind our backs and another spinal twist. I'm gonna push up with my arms a little bit, but I can start to rock my hips from side to side. Okay, a nice way to open up the hips a little bit. Even as you roll on the floor, your glutes are working through the mats a little bit. And that'll kind of take us through a quick seated flow that I like to do right there. All right, kiss that baby. Then we can go ahead and place our leg down, bring our opposite leg up, and we're gonna repeat the same processes on the other side. So again, leg is straight, we're relatively upright here. If you can't reach, towel or strap is gonna be great for you. But regardless, our goal is to be nice and straight. Again, even if this is too hard, come back to this. There's nothing wrong with this position and then pushing yourself forward to try and find that range, okay? So from here, we're inhaling up, exhaling, leaning forward slightly. Inhaling up, exhaling, leaning forward. Maybe you find just a little bit more range with that. If you dorsiflex the ankle, you'll find it even tightens up the fascia a little bit more. Inhaling up and then exhaling, whatever your comfort level is. If it's at the ankle, if it's all the way at the knee, you can reach the foot, great. All of that's gonna offer you some benefit. But again, there is no 100% right way to do this. And then we're holding this for breath. You find yourself in a position where you can't breathe very well, it means you're likely too deep in that position and maybe find yourself coming out a little bit where you can find that deeper breath. 
Now, interestingly enough, we'll keep breathing through this for just a little bit more. We did a cadaver dissection on the weekend and people were amazed when I showed the connection of the abdominal muscles to the diaphragm and to the pericardium. There is a very obvious and thick connective tissue connection between all of those. And uh, we probably wind up doing something for the NHPC here in a little bit as well. That's also related to the cadaver dissection, but this breath thing is foundational for your heart, for your digestion, for your abdominal movement. All of this is associated with our basic yoga practice. And then slowly bringing ourselves back up. And then from here, we have the option, taking that leg, crossing it back over. Again, you can't make it all the way there. Even just like this is going to be fine. Just even giving yourself a little bit of range. We all have patients who can only kind of show us this much. Make that, make that a small victory, the fact that they're even, even doing that. But if we can, crossing that leg to the opposite side, hand reaches behind, inhaling up, exhaling elbow to knee. We're finding ourselves spinning around. And again, holding this for breath. Try not to round into your back. Stay a little more upright. Inhales become a little bit taller. Exhales give you a little more spin. One more breath. And then slowly unwinding. And wouldn't you know it, you have twins. I apologize if anybody in the class only has one leg, but okay, you have twins. There's a second leg right here. So you're gonna support around the knee, grab that ankle if you can, or as close as you can get, lift that baby up and rock that baby around a little bit. Who's a good little baby? Okay, <laughs> give it some kisses. What a nice little baby that is, okay? Baby the other, other white meat. Okay. All right. Out of course would be from Austin Powers. Okay. And as you're ready, you can go ahead and put that baby back down, planting our hands behind our back, and then go ahead and give that kind of spinal low back kind of twist, just moving from side to side. It's not a typical transition, but I found at least for myself to get through the obliques and stuff, it's a pretty good movement. All right. Next up, both legs are gonna come in nice and tight. Hands are gonna come forward and we'll find ourselves in some nice cat cows. And I will use cat cows for almost every single patient that I'm treating with low back pain. There's a couple of reasons why this is gonna be an optimal choice for you. Number one is it's an unloaded way to move the spine. So just starting, we can go ahead and inhale and look up. And exhale and look down really arching that back, inhaling up, and then exhaling, looking down. Now, if you have somebody who does have chronic pain, they're often going to show you a limit in their range. Inhaling up, often extension will be okay, but as soon as you start flexion, they might get to a certain point and they'll go ahead and stop. So you have to respect that, but you want them to challenge it in an unloaded position. So another option you have and this works really quite well, bringing your toes together, knees are gonna go nice and wide, fading back into a nice child's pose and using your hands to actually decompress your low back and fight the cramp in your foot. There we go. <laughs> All right, can be a way that you can decompress the spine as well. Now, this is pretty cool because the mics are on me pretty good right here, but if you go onto YouTube, and we're just gonna hold this for breath for a while. If you go onto YouTube and type in Visniac, mom disc herniation. I had one mom come in. She's a new mom, couldn't breastfeed because she had chronic back pain, uh, excruciatingly bad. She had to go to the ER and she was given narcotic analgesics. So she couldn't breastfeed her child for about a week. And she had to sleep for about four days just in this position right here. This was the only position she could find to relieve her pressure. Her back was saying, please decompress me. So that was part of the treatment that we offered. But we had to find this through our exploration during the patient visit. This is what she found worked pretty well. So from here, we can go ahead and walk over to the right-hand side of our mats. So walking over to the right, opening up that left side body, and maybe even push your left side body into 
like into that breath a little bit. So leaning your spine over. And again, you can let your hips drop, sink in a little bit deeper if you can. If this was an actual class, we might give some overpressure on our clients, but switching to the opposite side. So walking over. Oh, and I did a ton of pull-ups yesterday. So this is great for my lats. I'm loving this. One more breath. Locking our hands back to the center. Maybe bringing them a little bit closer to our heads, bringing ourselves back up. Knees will come together. I'll show this from the side as well. So a couple of key things here. We can go back to some cat cows. You probably feel a little bit looser already. So we're gonna inhale looking up. Exhale looking down. And we're gonna go back to neutral. So inhaling back to tabletop. And if the patient is coordinated enough, one of the things that I like to do is get them into what I call spinal skipping. So you're gonna go ahead and laterally flex one way, arch your back over and pretend like your spine is a skipping rope. So you're basically moving around in very complicated action. You have to have pretty good coordination to be able to perform this well. But you're just working your way through Clockwise or counterclockwise doesn't matter because we're just going to reverse it anyway. All the way around and then stop in the midline there and maybe reverse the opposite direction. Maybe one more rotation. Okay, and then from here, we can put our weight back into our toes. So bring those up. Maybe your hands need to be a little bit further ahead, depends on where your balance point is. And you're gonna push yourself up into a nice downward dog. Now, you will see that the amazing Nikki looks like a Lululemon poster girl right there because her back is straight, her arms are straight, everything is out. And you'll look at me and you'll say, what's this guy doing? I would suggest to you that any way that you can get into it, the real goal of this is actually lengthening of your spine and opening up through the shoulders. So I would go ahead and put that pressure into my shoulders a little bit more by bending my knees if I don't have really good flexibility. So this position right here gets me down a little bit lower and you can walk that dog. I am a big fan of plantar and dorsiflexion. It'll help improve your squat depth and everything else. From here, we'll bring ourselves up into a nice high plank position. And this is one of my favorite things to do in a class is I'll say, okay, we're gonna go down to a count of three. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and down. Okay, now we can go ahead and turn our head to the side and we're just gonna breathe here a little bit and take some recognition of your shoulder position. Just relax your arms a little bit. Maybe your hands can shift out to the sides a bit, wherever you feel good balance. And we'll take a couple of breaths. One more big breath. This time we're gonna breathe in. And when we inhale, we're gonna lift our head up and turn it to the opposite side and bring ourselves back down. A couple of breaths here. And now we can bring ourselves up. You can decide if you wanna do low cobra is probably where I would start. So you're just gonna inhale, lift yourself up just a little bit. Exhaling, dropping back down. We're gonna inhale again. And this time when we lift up, we're gonna try and lift our hands just off the mat if you can. So they're just touching. Exhaling back down. 
and then inhaling up. One more time, hands are just off, planting the hands firm, curling the toes under, pushing back up into that downward dog. Walk that dog again, because that dog does get long once you've done some push-ups like this, some chaturanga movements. We're gonna take our right leg, shoot it up nice and high behind us, and take that right foot and then step it all the way up and in between our hands. I'm gonna change my orientation here a little bit. We're gonna plant our back knee on the ground and basically be in a low lunge position right here. Maybe I'll be off to the side just a bit. Okay, low lunge is usually pretty good for most people. You can maintain pretty good balance here if they can turn their foot out to the side if they want. So a couple of things again, working towards those hip flexors before we actually get into some pigeon and all of that good stuff. We can inhale, bringing our hands up a little bit and we can exhale and it's like we're pushing energy away from us. And hands shoot out. Inhaling back up. Exhaling, pushing out. Strong through the shoulders, good power. One more time, inhaling up. Exhaling out. Right on this last exhale, we bring our hands down to the mat and we can step our front foot out to the side a little bit. So you have a bunch of different options here. If it's hard to get down to that point, you can stay up on your fists, even put an elbow on your own knee if you want to, or in front of your thigh. Or if it's available for you, you can even drop down to your elbows. Do this modified lizard pose. So you might feel this more into your adductors, more into your hamstrings. Pretty good to start opening up the hip. Depends where you have your own unique variation, anatomical variations. Let's slowly bring ourselves back up to our hands. One hand can stay planted. You can just push on your knee if you want, or you can rotate all the way up. Spin yourself around. And again, through all of this process, maintaining breath as we hold it. Taking that high hand, bringing it all the way back down to the mat, planting both hands firm, weight into the back foot, lifting that leg up and then stepping back, downward dog again. And from here, we can come forward into our nice high plank position, bringing ourselves down nice and controlled. Three, two, one, your option. You can stay low or you can bring yourself up into a nice high cobra if you want as well. Upward facing dog. And I usually like to hold this for a little bit and just kind of rock from side to side just a little bit. And then we're going to bring ourselves back to downward dog. Left foot is going to shoot up nice and high. Left foot is now going to step forward all the way between your hands. Right knee comes to the mat, or I should say opposite side. And again, into this nice low lunge, nice stable position for most of us to be in. So a couple of points on this too, depending on how you're rocking your pelvis, you can really change how much of the stretch and motion you feel through your hips. So try and find that sweet spot. I'll talk more about that into pigeon once we get there. But we're gonna inhale, hands coming up. We're gonna exhale, shoulders are low, pushing hard through the hands. Inhaling, coming up. Exhaling. And then inhaling one more time. Exhaling. Both hands can now come on down to the mat. You can turn your foot out to the side a little bit. And you're more than welcome to just hang out here if you can't get down that far. Or if it's available, dropping your elbows all the way down to the mat. And trying to relax into that position as much as possible. So even myself, because it's a little bit tricky when you have to teach a class and explain it as you're doing it, I could feel the tension in my hips, but as soon as I took that breath and I said, relax down into it, I could let that tension go and sink down a little bit more deeply and more comfortably. And then from here, we can plant our hands down again. Plant our hands down, 
Spinning up, reaching up, looking up nice and high. And then slowly both hands come back to the mat. Weight comes into the back foot, lifting our knee up, stepping back into another downward dog. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to finally feel some looseness into that. So that's great. For a lot of patients I treat, I say, hey, I'll see you once every three to six months if you do yoga on a regular basis, or I can see you every week if you're like a computer programmer who just sits at their desk all day. Okay, from here, we're back into a high plank position. Elbows are gonna be in nice and tight. We're coming down to a count of three, two, one. Exhaling, upward facing dog. And then back to down dog. Now we're feeling a little bit stronger. Right foot shoots up nice and high. Right foot steps all the way through, plant the back heel, windmilling up, finding ourselves into a nice warrior two position. Now, for those of you who follow me on Instagram, you will know that I do archery on a regular basis. So we are all gonna become archers. Your front hand grabs a bow, holds it upright. Your back hand is ready to take an arrow. So you're gonna inhale. Arrow comes forward, exhale. You're gonna pull strong through your shoulders. Pull, pull, pull. When your hand hits your ipsilateral shoulder, release. Leaning forward a little bit more. Release. Get down a little bit more. Someone's shooting back at you. Inhaling forward, exhaling and release from here we're going to straighten out our front leg you're going to go sassy hip check back to get into those adductors sassy oh nikki i can see you're already sassy in the mirror there <laughs> okay we're going to reach forward a little bit further and then spinning ourselves up into a nice triangle pose should you not be able to reach the floor or your ankle whatever you're using for stability a block is a great option for you you don't have to be all the way down into it but again just trying to hold this position, relax, breathing. Then we're slowly going to release, bring ourselves back up, bending the front knee, looking up at our upper hand. And then from here, we can bring ourselves back to neutral. I usually like to do a transition of a wide-legged forward fold like this, where we'll even start to just rock our hips around just a little bit, okay, before we actually get down. So from here, just the side-to-side -side movements, kind of circumduction of the hips. Good way to explore that range. Good way to get that synovial fluid moving inside of those joints and then reverse the opposite direction. All right. And then from here, a nice big inhale. Exhale, forward fold all the way down. And it's your choice where your hands actually go. You can keep them right below. If you can reach underneath, go ahead and do that. Whatever feels comfy for your range today. Can you believe we get CE credits for doing this stuff? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, and so you can see for Nikki, especially, I don't, I guess I can force myself wider, but she's got pretty good range overall able to reach down to our ankles. If you want, you can go ahead and grab to one ankle. You can bring the pressure to the opposite ankle as you find range right there. We can slowly bring ourselves back up, nice and controlled all the way up. And then heel toe and walk our feet back in. And then we're going to reverse and face the opposite direction. So we're going to be warrior two on the opposite side. So you can bend your front knee, inhaling both hands up nice and high, good balance position. Grab that bow in your front hand. And we're all going to be little cupids sending out arrows of love right here. So backhand, grab some arrows. Exhaling, pulling that arrow back. Strong and low through the shoulder. 
release. Whoa, someone shot an arrow back at you. Get a little bit lower. Exhaling. And release. A little bit lower. One more time. Exhaling. And release. Front knee straightens out. Sassy hip check back. And it does make a big difference. That hip check back puts a lot more tightness on the posterior capsule. Reaching forward. Reaching forward more. And then whatever your version of triangle is, you can find yourself there. Look at that upper hand. It's a great position to try and maintain balance in too. And then slowly bringing ourselves back up, bending that front knee, looking up nice and high. Exalted warrior that you are. Nikki, I swear you look like the you look like the poster girl for yoga. It's like you've been doing this for a while. <laughs> only 36 and, uh, years. Only 36 years, yeah. All right. And then slowly releasing. We can find ourselves coming back to the center of our mats. A nice balanced position. We're going to do a couple of breaths here. So first one is going to be nice big inhale all the way up. Exhale to heart center. Inhaling up one more time. And this time our hands are gonna go wide as we come down into a nice forward fold all the way down and decompressing your back. So I gave a live patient case yesterday when I was teaching a bunch of doctors to be, and the patient actually said, it feels better when I lean down like this. She was telling the class that if you get into flexion, this decompression position is gonna be a winner. Now, a couple of key things here. If you look at Nikki, she's got way better hip flexibility than I do. So she can keep her legs straight and then come down. But as soon as I straighten my legs, I get stuck out here. I'd rather see people bend their knees and then be able to sink in a little bit deeper than try and force it with legs straight. Because the real goal here for a back pain patient case is going to be the decompression of the spine. And I only get there if I can bend my knees and have that kind of flexibility. So you can hold this for a couple of breaths. You can interlock your arms if you want and ragdoll from side to side. Also take the tension out of your neck. A lot of people keep their heads up. You have to let that neck relax. Now, if you've been in a forward fold for a while, one of the issues that can come up is it can result in you being lightheaded when you try to get back up. So we want to approach that with a halfway lift to begin with. So you can basically work yourself up halfway Am I okay? Take a breath and then breathe out. Forward fold and then nice and slowly, one vertebrae at a time, bending our back up nice and controlled. I find in a lot of chronic back pain cases, people cannot do this. They cannot round their back out nice and slowly. And you can see how slow we're coming up. Nice and slow, working your way back up eventually to the top. That's a coordinated movement that people with injuries have a difficult time doing. All right, so now we're back to a standing position. We're gonna go ahead and put our left foot forward just a little bit. And we're gonna find a balance point in between that where you should rock it from side to side. Try and find your big toe under the ball of your foot. Go to that pinky toe and the ball of your little foot, of your little toe, and then feel the weight back into your heel and then transfer your weight forward into that position. So we're gonna go into tree pose here in a second. And I strongly recommend this for people who have any kind of balance issues. Number one, even just standing the way I'm standing right now, if they can just hold themselves in a position like this and just get used to that, that would be a great place to start. Uh, Achilles tendon rupture patient I was dealing with yesterday, even this was a challenge for him. He can't actually lift up on his injured leg and his proprioception is so off, this is a challenge, this is where we start. Next level, you're going to take your heel and put it to your medial malleolus if you want. This is another great place. This is a pretty narrow base of support, but it starts to work on that balance foundation for people. Your age can be correlated with your ability to maintain balance. As we get older, we lose the ability to balance. So your option, depending on your flexibility, you can go 
heel to calf if you want. We generally don't want to push across the knee because it gives a lot of pressure around the lateral collateral ligament. If it's there, pull up your shorts or whatever it is and get your heel all the way up nice and tight. And then from here, you're looking out in the distance for something to balance your eye and your gaze onto. I believe it is called a drishti or balance point that you're looking for. And I'm picking one of the holes in the bottom of the shipping containers here. All right. If you're available for it, both hands are gonna inhale up nice and high. Exhaling, and then dropping our shoulders back now. And this is a little bit tricky to balance in here because we're actually not on a hard floor, we're on mats. I don't know how it is for you, Nikki, but I can feel my ankles really working hard oh, yeah. on this. Yeah. So your goal should be to open up this hip as well if it's available. And for me, this is usually good enough to go into, but you can also start rocking your body from side to side. Like there is a wind in the forest, good dynamic ability to maintain that position. All right. From here, bring our hands down to our hips. You have a couple of options here. You can just stay like this. You can go back down to a more neutral position, or you can bring that knee forward. I'll just fade off to the side here a little bit. That knee's gonna come forward. We're gonna go ahead and shoot that leg back as we bring our upper body forward as well and find ourselves balanced out in a position something like this. And Nikki's gonna show a variation with blocks so you can reach and stabilize. And of course she looks almost picture perfect. And here I am struggling to get this leg up, but that's okay. And then we're slowly gonna bring ourselves back up and then fall out of that as much as possible. If you fall, make it epic, that's the key thing. <laughs> Shake out that left leg, because that's a lot of balance time on that right there. Then we're gonna repeat on the opposite side. So right foot comes forward. We feel that foot, get kinesthetic sense into that foot, right? Rock to the side, rock to the side, forward on your toe, back on your heel. Find yourself balanced and then bring your weight to that foot. And if this is all you have to start with, just start right here, it's fine, this is great. Okay, if you're able to, you go heel to ankle, you can maintain this balance right here. If the next variation is available, you can go over top of your gastroc with your heel. And then if that's still available, still feeling good, bring yourself all the way up and inner thigh balance here. You may notice a difference from one side to the other if, as you're setting this up. So you always wanna try and find that variation. Both hands are together at the front. Inhaling up, <sighs> exhaling, shoulders come back and down. I'm a bigger fan of the arms apart, but you can do any variation you want. Hands to heart center, hands above your head, whatever works. This way I find people often have a better way to balance and catch themselves. But the one thing for the trees is there's always wind in the forest or hopefully a little bit. So we got to blow from side to side, keep that dynamic movement happening right there. Okay. All right. And then from here, hands can go ahead, bring them down to your hips. If you'd like knee comes forward, shooting that leg back, shooting that leg back and then up nice and high. And there's a couple of variations here. I'm just gonna keep it simple. Some people will go to the full open. I won't be able to do it without a support where they lift their arm up. Some of us will keep nice and flat like this as well. Really good one leg stability exercise here. Keeping that leg back, bending the knee forward, bringing yourself back up and then slowly out of that position and then shake out that right leg. Good work. Good job, crew. I can't see you, but we're doing good. I know I feel like I want to crack the windows here. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're going to go again one more time. We're going to inhale all the way up. Exhaling hands down to heart center. All the way up one more time. Exhaling down, forward fold. And depending on where you are on your mat, you can walk your hands forward or walk your feet back wherever you are and then get into a nice forward downward dog here. And walk that dog and holy man, I am feeling great. I bring myself up into a nice high plank position, down to a count of three, two, one, and then all the way down, upward facing dog. A couple of breaths and balance here. Back onto the toes. Right foot's gonna shoot up nice and high. Right knee is going to come into right wrist as we spin into a nice 
pigeon pose. Now, I loves me some pigeon. And I'm blocking you a little bit, Nikki. You gotta make, you gotta make Nikki look like the all-star she is. <laughs> so I'm gonna back up a little bit for her here. Okay, so a couple of key things here. Number one, you want to find yourself rocking from side to side to really feel where you feel the most load and stretch with this position. Number two, generally to start, I like to start in a higher pigeon, just keeping your chest up and balanced. And I'll even use my hands to decompress my back a little bit as I roll and try and find that joyful discomfort spot in here. So leaning from side to side. Take a couple of breaths and it's a nice high pigeon. And we can go ahead, bring our elbows down to the mat as we step forward. And your forehead can rest on your wrists if you'd like. Just working on our breath. We can slowly release ourselves out of this. Pressure back in through our elbows, walking our hands back. Now, whatever your variation and availability is for this, maybe just get into the back into the high pigeon, bending the back knee if it's available. And then with the opposite arm, reaching back and finding a little bit of range through there. Or it's Nikki with her ravishing red strap right there so everybody can see what she's doing. Another way for us to reach into it. All these variations are shown in the yoga book. We actually have a whole poster on how to use the strap in all different positions. But again, working on that breath, if it's there for you, if you have the ultra flexibility, which I do not, you can actually reach up the opposite way. But for me, this is, this is going to be good enough. Yeah. There you can see Nikki doing a fantastic demo of that. Holding this for breath. I think I only need another 15 years and I'll be as good as her, okay, or not. And we can slowly release that, letting the foot drop. Hands are gonna plant again, putting strength into that back leg, lifting up, back into a nice downward dog this way. Forward back into chaturanga plank, push up. Bring ourselves down, four, three, two, one, controlling that descent, upward facing dog again, and then back to down dog. Left foot shoots up nice and high, left knee to left wrist, and then dropping down to pigeon on our opposite side. Hmm. Again, micro movements. You can dorsiflex your ankle if you're feeling a little bit of pressure on your knee or change the angle of your knee flexion just to take that pressure off. And then we can bend our elbows, bring ourselves down, forehead to wrists. And then slowly bringing ourselves back up. Hands can plant, pushing back up, bending that back knee, reaching around with the contralateral side. Such a great way to spend the afternoon, actually.
slowly releasing. Now, this will be one of my favorite transitions to do because it's like a jujitsu move when you're going for an arm bar. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop onto our hips. So you're just gonna slide your body over to the side as much as we can. And then the opposite leg is gonna spin around, catch your opponent and pull them back in. We're gonna go into some supine positions right now. So I have to move my, camp, my uh, microphone jack here a little bit. Nikki's already set up, good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we find ourselves in this position right here, and then we can slowly bring the other leg out and we can drop ourselves down. But you know what I feel like? I feel like going for a boat ride, don't you? Okay, so we can go ahead if you want, even just this is a good place to start. Holding onto your patellas or back of your leg, whatever you like, and you can slowly bring yourself back down. See how do I feel with that? And then bringing yourself back up. Just kind of gauging what the range of motion feels like. Okay, everything's all right. Maybe you toss one leg up. Maybe you toss both legs up. Maybe the hands get free. And maybe you decide that you don't have a power boat, you have a rowboat. So what do you need to do? You have to start rowing your boat gently down the stream, but your boat also has sails. So what are we gonna do? Sails up, sails up. I got such thin legs that I'm gonna tip back here in a second. <laughs> okay, and then we're gonna go ahead and row our boats again. Big circular stroke, 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 and then sails up, sails up. And then we can bring our knees in nice and tight and slowly roll ourselves back down to the mat, nice and controlled. <sighs> All right, so a couple of key things here. If I have a patient with acute low back pain and it's really bad and they find no position really helps except for laying down, I will start them here. And one of the ways I can tell they can progress is if I can get them to do windshield wipers. So dropping both of your knees over to one side and seeing how they can tolerate that and then spinning to the opposite side. And usually what I find in practice is they'll show me one way is great. They'll say, yep, it's no problem to go that way. But when I go the other way, oh, sharp pain right there. I can't go any further. Great. That's a starting point for us to start to explore that pain and discomfort the person might have. So you want to bring yourself down. This is great because it takes the oblique muscles, makes you contract your back a little bit, but again, in an unloaded position. So we can go ahead and reverse from side to side. Just get them moving a little bit. A little bit of breath. Always back to breath whenever we can. All right. So just a nice gentle way to start mobilizing the spine. Totally safe for you to do on your table. Lots of range to do that with. Again, the spine is unloaded when you do that. So now we'll bring both of our knees flexed up here. We're going to bring our heels just to our fingertips right here. And this will be another check. I don't do this until things are a little bit more further on for most like acute disc injuries that I see. But regardless, a posterior pelvic tilt and just get them to lift their hips off the ground just the littlest bit and then drop yourself back down. Lift yourself off the ground just the littlest bit and then drop yourself back down. And if all of that's okay, then we can go for a more full lift so we can have them tilt their pelvis up, lift the lumbar vertebrae up, and then start to lift those thoracic vertebrae up nice and all the way through. And if that's still good, you can interlock your hands underneath your glutes and roll onto each of your shoulders. So you're rolling back and then you're gonna push up and in in that position. Couple of wins here. Number one, this can really stretch out that cervical thoracic junction. So that's huge value for people. Number two is you're focusing on lifting up. This can actually reverse, invert the organs a little bit. So it can theoretically aid with a little bit of digestion. But the third thing is you should be looking down at your belly and showing me a good breath. So you look like you're, I don't know, Nikki, three months pregnant, four <laughs> months pregnant. Okay. You should have that nice Buddha belly there at the front. And then holding this for breath. You can see a good variation from Nikki there too. If you can't, hold it or don't want to hold it, a block under the glutes or under the low back is usually going to be pretty good. If you want, and if your flexibility allows it, you can take your own hands and support your glutes as well. And even lift yourself up into a position like this and relax just a bit. When I'm usually cueing this, what I'll have people do is I'll say, contract into your quads, contract into your quads, and like really lift and jam their bodies up. 
Okay. Then we can slowly put our hands out to the side, bring ourselves back down, and then back to a few windshield wipers might not be a bad idea either. So just letting them drop and letting them drop. And slowly back to neutral. And we're going to lift up again, but this time we're going to add more dynamic stability to it. So you're going to bring your hips up, lumbar spine comes up, low back comes up, hands can be out to the side. I find for people to have better balance, they can control with their arms. Step your left foot kind of to the midline and then put your right foot out nice and straight. A couple of options here. We can bring that right foot up nice and straight above our body and then we're gonna drop it down to the side and then bring it right back up. Drop it down to the side again, keep those hips up and then all the way back up. And one more time, all the way down and all the way up. Bending that knee, bringing ourselves back down. And then we're going to repeat on the opposite side, except I'm not going to repeat on the opposite side because I don't want to watch this YouTube commercial. <laughs> okay, so you guys all at home can go ahead and repeat. I knew I should have picked longer than an hour. All right. Okay, so what's nice about this setup, if you're doing this action, you have to work hard. You have to have good core strength and balance to catch that leg and then bring the person right back up. What else is nice about this? This is how you catch people in jujitsu. You actually put your leg down, reach up and grab them and pull them back down. So awesome power and strength from that. Bring ourselves back down. It's nice and relaxed here. If we want, we can go ahead and bring our knees up, curling over with our arms. There's those little babies again that you had. You can give those knees kisses if you wanted to again. You can just roll from side to side, give that little bit of massage into your back with gravity and your own body weight. And then from here, we can take one leg and let it fall straight. Let the opposite leg twist over to the side. Opposite hand can be pushing down on it. And then other side, looking over the contralateral shoulder. And looking at this for breath. So big breath in, and then all the way out. And we can slowly release that, bring ourselves down to the opposite side. So knee bends, letting it drop reaching and looking over our opposite shoulder. All right, and then slowly back. Both of those knees can come up, heels can be together, grabbing those heels. Grab the inside of your ankles, whatever works. And one thing I know about babies is babies are usually happy. So we can bring those feet up and into a nice reversed happy baby pose. Now, the key thing for being a baby is, and the auditory stuff works, you have to go ahead and say what babies say. And babies say, gaga goo goo. So I need <laughs> you guys all to hear you say it. Gaga -ga goo goo. All right. Nikki, I didn't hear it. Gaga the goo goo. There she is, a happy baby. <laughs> All right. So we're going to fade away into Shavasana here in just a little bit. But before we do, we're going to bring our heels together, let our feet drop back down, and just let our hips be nice and open. So you're really stretching out through those adductors. If it's there for you too, you can interlock your hands behind your head and let your elbows drop out to the side too. And a couple of breaths here. And we can take our legs, straighten them out. Hands can come down to the side if you'd like, or if it's more comfortable for you, you can put your one hand onto your abdomen, right over your belly, one hand over your heart, over your chest, whatever works. 
setting an intention, thinking how fantastic and lucky we all are to have functioning bodies and what an influence we can have on our clients that we see on a daily, daily basis. Gently closing our eyes with gratitude and breath. Maybe slowly bring some awareness back into our fingers, back into our toes. Gentle movements. Wrists and ankles. Keep our eyes closed. Maybe even lifting our shoulders up a little bit, squeezing our glutes, a little bit of movement. Bending our left knee, rolling over onto our right hand side. Legs can come up as you're ready, sitting up into a nice relaxed position here, palpating your mat, finding yourself centered again. A couple of nice breaths. Slowly opening our eyes into the room. Inhaling both hands up nice and high. Exhaling hands to heart center with a namaste and thank you for today. I often say anatome instead of namaste because we are moving our anatome. Anatomy is what I'm trying to say. All right. Thank you very much for joining this practice. We're going to take a little bit of a break right now and we're going to continue on looking at specific poses and variations that we can do within those poses. And the amazing Nikki told me she hasn't done any kind of acro stuff. So we might have to toss her around here a little bit today as well. So first time, first time. All right. Just don't drop me. Okay. I won't drop you. It's okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Questions, comments. How's everybody doing? Um, oh, everybody still disappeared into the Shavasana right now. I'm loving it. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick 15 minute break or so, and then we will see you guys. Well, it'll be 10 to 15. So a little bit on the shorter side, 
and then we'll see you all in a little bit to discuss a little bit more specifics of some of the tests and things that you might use in practice. All right, cheers. See you in a bit. Yep, Leslie, I can see right there, you've got a statement. This was quite difficult. I normally stand all day, but the last three or four days, uh, but the last three days, four, if you include today, I have been sitting in courses. Yes. Even any course I teach, like every 40 minutes, I'm like, everybody stop, take a break, go and do something, or I got to get you up and moving you around a little bit, right? You're not good on the correct floor. Sure, the flooring makes a big difference, but at the end of the day, even the thinnest mat is going to be enough to allow you to get a little bit more range out of it, right? Like one of the reasons I love our massage therapy, Cairo joint mobs, manual medicine practices is because I can be up and moving all day with that. Even when I'm teaching, if I'm teaching the driest anatomy topic ever, it's like, okay, and here are the muscles of the hand and let's get up and move. So you'll often see on my Instagram that I'll post up a picture of me stretching with a class. The research is clear. You learn better if you move while you're learning. And especially uh, there's good studies that actually show people going for a little 10 minute walk and then coming back and actually being more productive if they didn't take than if they didn't take that break. So you want to take lots of mini breaks as much as possible. And again, move your body in different ways. I've been doing yoga since 98, but the other thing that I would put out there for you as well, and it's going to sound crazy. Hopefully we have a couple of people in the class who do this. Brazilian jiu-jitsu on a regular basis, yeah, you can see her laughing right there. It gives you strength and flexibility because I am not like, I'm a pretty thin guy, relatively speaking, I only weigh about 175, 180 pounds, but I have done powerlifting, CrossFit. I have got all kinds of buddies and even myself have done anabolic steroids in the past to see how we can gain weight and do all this kind of stuff. And nothing has made me as strong as more difficult yoga practices or the Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Literally, you can, I take apart guys who are 200, 250 pounds, and it's about technique and how you know how to move your body and have that flexibility. So I would encourage you all, there's lots of women's classes as well, if that's something that's a little bit intimidating for you, but it definitely gives self-empowerment. I teach it to my daughters and they already know how to get their legs up in front, block somebody and move them around a little bit. There's little things that you can do, subtle movements, just like we see in our yoga practices that can make you substantially stronger. And I take this with me into my clinical practice as well. Or Nikki, have I ever, ever talked about Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu to you at all oh, or not? Every single time I go to Dr. Nick for treatment, yeah. starts with that. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> that, that'll be the first thing. Jiu-Jitsu, Jiu-Jitsu, okay. So I would encourage you to at least take a class or roll with somebody who knows what they're doing. I only tend to roll with other professionals and doctors who know the limits but I really call it a forced yoga program. In fact, what I might even do is post a picture of some jujitsu stuff where I have, we have a full poster that shows all the positions. And just like we have for our yoga posters, let me flip this around so everybody can see it. If I walk around this way, you can see, oh, it's one of the ones that's down here. We have ones that show yoga block positions, yoga positions. We also just made one for Brazilian jujitsu positions as well. So it's like a partner partnered yoga if you want. And I'll show a little bit of that here with Nikki here in a bit, but you'll have to have a partner for it. So for us for right now, we're just going to go through some of the poses and some of the key things that you can do with people in your office, on your table, how you can modify positions. Now I'm teaching to a bunch of professionals who treat a lot of patients. Is it not amazing how body unaware some people are? Like I'll get this table set up right here and I'll give you a patient from uh, Friday last week who came in and I'm like, okay, she's got low back pain. So we're getting her through her ranges of motion like this. She's all set up and I'm like, okay, can you go ahead and you're going to drop your chest and uh, push your middle back up a little bit. And she's like, like this. And this is what she does. So she moves back and down and forward like this. I'm like, no, 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 no. just push on your hand. What I want you to do is drop your head even, and then push up like this and her movement pattern. She could not break this cycle right here. And then fading back like that. So the first thing that I would suggest that everyone does is of course, getting permission to do this, but put your hands on your patient to get them to move in the direction you want them to move in. Little stimulation where you brush on them and say, hey, can you move this arm back? Can you bring this leg forward? Can you lift this part of your back a little bit more? Those are key for kinesthetic sense and movement that takes place for most people. So you have to give them that little bit of feedback to do it. When I teach more complicated movements like we do in jujitsu or when I teach joint mobilizations, 
there's a lot going on for that action to happen. And the first thing I do is I tap a student on the leg and I'm like, bend this knee so they can feel that. Because if you say right or left, if you notice when I did my yoga practice, I didn't use right or left very often. It's confusing for people, right? You want to try and avoid that as much as possible. And especially for any of you who teach a yoga class, when you say inhale and raise your left arm and you want the class to raise their left arm, you are raising your right. So you have to reverse it the entire time. And it adds an extra level of complexity. Maybe you don't need to do with your patients in your office. So that'll be the first thing, kinesthetic feedback. Give them the actual verbal cues or even better yet, demo for them in your own practice too. So oftentimes you'll see me, I'll just hop on the floor there on the table and I'll say, hey, this is what I want you to do. These kind of a movements, especially if they haven't seen it before. So that'll be the first thing for us to go through. I've got a couple of Q&A questions here. So let me just pull those up for one second. Hey, Dr. Nick, I've recently been hearing some feedback from various therapists stating that yoga is not the best practice for back injuries regardless of injury state, or can I get some clarification regarding these comments, please? So that's a great one, Miss Maggie Ho. Okay. So the first thing that I would say on this is every treatment that you have is going to be good for a patient population and maybe not good for another patient population. If we had this magic bullet that cured everybody, we'd all be doing the same treatment. So what works for one person on one day may not work for that same person on the next day. Most of us have probably experienced that. It's not about being, when you say yoga, it kind of catches people a little bit because they think, oh, I got to twist myself into a pretzel. No, that's not what it is. It's about exploring range of motion is what you're really trying to do here. So cases where yoga may not be of benefit in a back injury, a prime example would be a lumbar disc herniation. So if you come in and you have a disc that is just been herniated, so that means the outer part of the annulus fibrosis has actually been damaged and you've got this this right here, the person comes in to see you. I got to move this so I can see on my screen what I'm doing. But patient comes in and they're talking to you and they're like, oh yeah, it's worse when I cough, sneeze or strain. And it's like, <coughs> <coughs> and you can see that disc bulging out. For me to take a bulging disc with damaged fibers and then twist it, they're not going to like that. That's why I start off when we went in the yoga practice today, it was earlier on, but why do I start off with the windshield wipers of the knees, it's my gauge to see how well they're going to move. So I'm just going to move my mic off to the side here a little bit, probably to the other side. Eh, where am I going to put this thing? I don't have a belt on, so I don't know where to put any of this stuff. So let's just get this in. Okay. So let's just say somebody comes in acute low back pain. You're not sure what they can tolerate. The vast majority of patients that you see, they're going to come in and they're going to say, you know what, once you get them on the table, because I'm sure we've all had this where the person literally is in your waiting room like this or sitting at the chair in your, in your office like this, and they're pushing up with their arms. If somebody is doing that, we call that minor sign. That's in our orthopedic assessment book. But what am I doing? I am decompressing my own back. I'm lifting off here to try and decompress it. That patient is telling you decompression of my spine is what I need. So another way that we'll decompress, and we've all seen people do this, where we have to help them down. They're super guarded. They're laying down like this. It takes them like 30 seconds. They're really catching their breath. They can't breathe through it. And you're helping to twist them around and you eventually get them into a position like this. And they're like, okay, I can hang out and breathe right here. My go-to test is if it's worthless coughing, sneezing and straining, I still will challenge them into a little bit of twist. But if you notice what I'm doing here, it is a decompressed spine. Gravity is not pushing down on them. And my real test is, hey, can you drop your knees to the side? And what I'll do is I'll be there right away to catch their knees because oftentimes they might even have weakness or numbness and tingling with it. And I'm trying to avoid that. I've got one plumber that has just gone back to work now after six months of being off work. And he had a disc herniation, shooting pain down his leg that was worse with every activity, pretty much every activity that he did. And he came in to see me after four months of pain. And I'm like, look, we've got to break the cycle and get you through this injury because he's stuck at a plateau of healing. So where did we start? We had him in like this position and I had him drop his legs to one side. So he holds onto the side of the table, drops his legs down. And you know what? Oh, you can see it in their faces. He's like, oh, I can't actually move like that. I didn't think I could. What's the nice thing about this position? Can everybody see, like you can see it on my shirt, how it's distracting my low back, but it's selectively distracting more on my right-hand side, the side that's up. Great, we know that that's a safe movement. We can start to do that, okay? As he came back up, he said, oh, that hurts a little bit. Why does it hurt when you lift back up? 
you're taking your erector spiny muscles and all the structures that control and the obliques and everything, they have to contract, they compress the low back a little bit. So I actually helped them bring himself back up. He's like, okay, thanks. Let's try the other direction, other direction. He got to about 20 degrees of movement. He's like, nope, I can't do that. That's in shooting pain down my legs. Great, that's a starting position to work from. So even right here, we can already start to get him moving. I see a lot of people talking about doing like glute bridges and all that, where you're lifting, you're lifting up and holding this position. I want everybody to understand when they're watching us move, when I have to lift up like this, this movement means my abs contract, my erector spiny and glutes all contract to hold that position. When they're contracting, they're compressing down on my spine. This often makes the symptoms worse. So you're just gonna start with your simple ranges of motion to begin with is all you wanna do, okay? To say that yoga is bad, yeah, if you really force yourself into extreme end ranges and all that kind of stuff, yes, it can make symptoms absolutely worse. So you have to be ultra selective on the activities that you have a patient do as you're progressing, as they're progressing through this stuff. So I'm starting from least invasive to most invasive. If you're watching this at home, what I would strongly encourage you to do is write that down. That's a key principle of medicine that I've been trying to put out for the last 20 years. Start from the least invasive, go through baby steps, see what they can tolerate, and then celebrate the small victories. And it might not seem like it's that big of a deal, and a lot of patients will play it off. But what if, like happened for Nathan, our plumber here, he was laying down, this guy does jujitsu too, like he's a strong guy, so I'm not worried about his core weakness. But what if on the first visit, it was like, no, I had to help him back up, and then he got, oh, and that's as far as he could move, okay? That was a great starting point, all right? Then the second visit he came in and he's all of a sudden, he drops his legs down and he brings them back up without any pain or complaint or anything from him. I stop the treatment right there and I say, do you realize how that's different from the last time you came in? So he can tell that he's getting better. It doesn't seem like much, but for you to be able to go from someone lifting you up to being able to do it yourself is a great way to show the person and build their confidence so they can start to move themselves through those ranges. So that would be the first thing I would say as I'm trying to progress through, okay? The next thing I will say is that you want to gradually increase the load. And especially in people with low back pain, what do they do? The research is clear on this. They stop flexing their backs. So again, for Nathan, when I watched him walk in, he's my prime example because he's fresh in my mind is one of the more frequent visits I've had recently. I usually don't see people for many multiple visits, usually really space them out. A lot of people will see somebody again and again and again. I'm more about getting people better faster and then self-affection activities that they can do. Infectious, not infectious, effective activities. Uh, what am I trying to say? Regardless, when you watched him come in and take his shoes off, he would take his shoes off like people do in our clinic. And his movement was extremely guarded. Back was straight. He'd come down like this, pick them up and toss them into the shoe rack and do all that. That is common for people with low back injuries. I actually herniated my own disc actually here in the yard, or I should say in my neighbor's yard, and it was the same thing. I did not want to bend my back. So for early yoga practice, people are just literally going to keep their backs ultra straight. And if you don't break that cycle, that's going to be their movement pattern for the rest of their life. So many people have gotten benefit from not only the, the windshield wiper drops, we're not going to do cat cows just yet, but when you get them on your table, you put their knees apart, you can have them lean back like this. And if I have low back pain, what am I going to do? I'm going to keep that back pretty straight and they're going to sink up like this and their hips will raise, right? But if I can get you to explore, if you watch just what I did right there, hands can grip, rounding out that low back and then leaning back, this is a win. Two reasons that this is a win for you. Number one, it's a range they don't think they can do. And number two, the spine is decompressed. So again, I'm not doing in a weighted position. I'm doing an unweighted position and I can see that back round out. I know that this is a relatively safe place. My chance of causing an injury in that position is basically zero. That's why it's child's pose is considered a relaxation pose. I didn't say it in this morning's practice or the first part of the practice here today. Normally I would say when we're going through this, if anytime anything feels like too much, drop yourself back into child's pose. That's a nice relaxing position. So the bending of the back is key. And I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on that. Okay. When you have chronic low back pain, people's backs tighten down and they stop bending them. Even the research by Stuart McGill is being disproven now because he talks about, oh, when you do a deep squat and you get your butt wink at the bottom where your back rounds out, that's a bad thing. No, that is not a bad thing. That is normal functional movement. We'll get into squats in a little bit. 
Nikki's going to go into garland pose and stuff like that in a little bit here for us as well. So we'll see, we'll see that, but I'm going to make a few conversations around that. Squats will be a whole separate issue. So I'm just looking at the kind of back issues right now. When else is yoga not a best practice is when you have somebody who is extremely inflexible. And having said that, they actually probably need it the most and can benefit the most, but they'll often be frustrated. And actually, if they really talk to you and are open about it, they're scared to try it. They don't want to challenge themselves and push themselves into those directions. They'll come into a class and be like, oh, I'm going to suck at this. I don't want to be the worst person in the class. It doesn't matter. In your clinic, in your practice, it's a safe place for them to explore those ranges. And what I'll do for some guys, especially because you get your macho men in there who don't want to, oh, yoga, that's for little girls, blah, 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 kind of thing, as I won't even tell them it's yoga. I'm just going to say, hey, we're going to do some range of motion assessment on you. See how you move with this. And away we go. Because did you know? The inhale, hands up, exhale, hands wide, forward fold action. That is a standard yoga movement right there. Why not just do lumbar range of motion and watch how they move? Low back pain, look straight. They can't get down and they're like, oh, and their knee will bend and they won't be able to get their body down, there, okay? Versus good movement is gonna be them coming down, rounding that back out, feeling that normal range of motion, finding it, and then the same thing, bringing themselves back up, okay? And of course, other contraindications for yoga would be your standard red flags that we might see, like fractures, infection, you know, severe pain of undiagnosed origin until you've actually figured it out. But I would suggest to you the vast majority of your patients will benefit from yoga type practices, especially as the age group gets older. So here I am approaching middle age, about two thirds of the way through my practice career, probably never going to retire, but I'm not going to be quite as busy because I got to tell you this year with kids and all the sporting events and everything like that, I'm flying to Virginia tomorrow morning. It is just too much stuff going on right now. But as we get older, loss of flexibility is one of the major signs of aging. Like you guys don't realize this. Nikki's like 78. Okay. All right. You're looking back oh, here. Nick. Yeah. <laughs> all right. It has to do with maintaining better functional capacity longer in life. And I have a number of geriatric patients. I had a 90 year old on my table. And for these people, like some of my treatments that I give are pretty aggressive treatments. Like I move on people pretty hard, but when I have a geriatric patient, I honestly feel like I'm going to break them. Like I'm going to snap bones in them or something like that. So I switch over to more yoga movement based therapies for them. And that is a huge indication for those people especially anybody who's losing flexibility, okay? And that's one of the major signs of aging. So we're always just fighting around that. And in fact, I would suggest all of you should change your practice names to forever young massage therapy or whatever else it is, because really what are we doing when we give our massage therapy treatments? We are also working on maintaining flexibility and malleability of the tissue, right? As people lose that flexibility, major sign of aging. All right, so that would be my take about that. And the other thing maybe that could be a risk for yoga is if their body is so deconditioned and you toss them into a more aggressive class and they physically can't keep up and they might injure themselves that way. In a second, I'm going to talk about wrist positions and ankle positions to avoid injury. If you notice for today's practice, I tried not to spend too much time on our wrists and hands. There was a little bit of transition from downward dog, forward uh, downward dog to chaturanga and moving through there where your wrists do take a little bit of pressure but you're trying to maintain minimal pressure. One thing you notice that Nikki did really well, and we'll talk about this, is how she even planted her hand. So this is the floor right here or your mat. You're planting your fingertips in first. That takes pressure off of the heel of your hand and opens up the fingers a little bit. And we'll look at the mechanics of that here in a second. So I'll come back to that. But anybody with chronic wrist pain and all of that. Now, one other thing I will say for a contraindication for yoga therapy, or not really a contraindication, but more of a precaution, is when I treat a lot of yoga practitioners, gymnasts, and dancers. And for whatever reason, I am popular with parents who have kids in gymnastics right now. I'm seeing a ton of them that are like 12 to 14-ish kind of age. And these kids, or one of them is seven actually, who's been in a few times already, are incredibly competitive and they are forcing their bodies to their extreme limits so far so that they're developing instability. And that would be an example where I wouldn't want to give them deep held, long held yoga poses because they're already so flexible. I don't need you moving beyond your normal range of motion of your joints. So let me just show you on this right here, on this model right here, everybody has bones that are roughly the same shape. We do have a little bit of anatomical variation with it for sure, but most of us have bones that are the same shape. What makes it so that women on average are more flexible than men 
is the elastic fiber content we have in our ligaments. Women have to be ready for childbirth and that kind of stuff. And so they're eventually going to have more flexibility available to them. And this is population-based averages. Of course, there's going to be exceptions to the rule as we go through. When I'm looking at these gymnasts and dancers, what are they actually able to do? They actually dislocate or disarticulate their joints when they have areas of instability. And their movements are so extreme that every time they dislocate it or, you know, sublux it, if you want to word it that way, is they are having their muscles go into spasm and lock down and they don't have good core stability around it. And that repetitive, repeated instability can lead to osteoarthritis, degeneration, and chronic pain cycles that we typically see. So one of my, one of my ballroom dancers right now, she is in her mid fifties, incredibly flexible, teaching fantastic classes all over the place. And my advice to her has been, do not go so deep into these positions. I know it sounds counterintuitive, but she can do splits sideways, splits to the front. She can bend back and touch her head to the floor when she's in the splits. Like all these extreme ranges of motion have a cost for the muscle stability and ligamentous structural support around the tissue as you're working on these people. And like another prime example that I would give is I dislocated this shoulder about eight years ago now, nine years ago now. And uh, so the example there was, I want to say it was jujitsu. The guy was like five, the guy was like six foot six, 280 pounds. Nope. I was out playing adult tag with a bunch of students. So I'm running as fast as I can tag Dr. Weir, who is in Victoria right now, Vancouver Island. I trip and fall in her legs. And as I fall down, I go to, I go to get back up and I'm on my knees like this. And I grab my, my pull my arm back and all of a sudden, oh, just shooting pain in my shoulder. I'm like, what the hell's going on here? Pull it again. I'm like, well, I'm not going to do that again. You can tell I'm a slow learner because I have to do it twice before I get it right. Go to palpate where my shoulder should have been, my humerus should have been, and it was down in front of my arm right here. This is the most common way that you dislocate a shoulder. Now, I am not extremely flexible. I have pretty good flexibility for my age group and everything like that but I had dislocated this joint. That means all the ligaments around the structure had to be ruptured, were torn apart, and the joint was out of place. I had to teach a yoga class that night. I was also doing an orthopedics class that afternoon. So I'm sitting there, great. I'm gonna have to get one of the guys here to come and help me relocate my shoulder. As I stood up, I pulled down on my arm into my hip like this. And as I pulled in, it was enough to get it around the glenoid labrum and then pop it back into place. So sharp pain for a second. And then it felt ultra loose after that. And this is not in the literature. You can read it in our orthopedic conditions book. I should toss that out there. For those of you who don't have it, okay. Sean, I know you've got one of these. Amanda, I know you have one of these, okay, where we talk about the top 300 conditions you'll see in practice. I didn't read about any literature anywhere in the literature until I experienced it myself. When you see me go up the stairs, I like to take two stairs at a time. Well, every time I hopped up, it literally felt like this arm was going to just drop right back out of joint again because I didn't have muscle stability and the ligaments were so lax. If you have somebody like that, I'm not going to put them into extreme ranges where they're interlocking shoulders and rolling all the way through and doing all these movements because it can cause a dislocation to occur again. And some people with unstable shoulders might even be up here. I had one student, her husband actually had an unstable shoulder, big, strong guy. And she said, yeah, I went through shoulder range of motion and his arm just popped right out. So he had a pre-existing instability right there. Now for me, for the rehab, the way that I went through it was I started my rehab early. I actually started that night before I had to teach the yoga class after the orthopedics class, which was a great learning opportunity for the students. Cause it was literally, can you grab your shoulder? Yep. Can you lift your arm? Nope. That's a killer pain. I cannot lift it at all. I started rehabbing that night. So what did I do? I started doing my tubing exercises. All I could do, get my arm out to right about here, get my arm into external rotation right about there before sharp pain came on. That's when you need to start the rehab processes. My yoga class that evening, I like to do the yoga classes as we do it. It was a nice three-legged downward dog because I didn't want to stretch my arm out. It would be absolutely contraindicated for you to have somebody who had just had a shoulder dislocation or instability to get this arm above their head and then try and support this table can support me and try and support that shoulder weight of their, of their body in this upper extended position right there. I almost guarantee the shoulder would re-dislocate them. So that would be another contraindication where yoga wouldn't be recommended. And then the other thing I should say about this too is 
I have back like 99.9 .9 to 100% range of motion. I get people who lock me in the strong positions in Kimuras and Americanas and Jiu-Jitsu all the time. And I can work my way out of it because the rehab has been complete on this. A lot of people do not follow their full rehab. They don't go all the way through the exercises. They're like, oh, everything's good enough. I'm just going to run with it the way it is. And then when you go to those elite level challenges, you find that you don't have the strength. So if somebody, and if you don't have the strength, especially for the shoulder, we know that 50% of your shoulder stability comes from the rotator cuff muscles. Well, if those muscles aren't firing right and working right, your chance of a dislocation is substantially higher. Okay. All right. The other thing that happens in yoga is people do crazy stuff who do not have medical backgrounds and anatomy knowledge. I know a couple of neurologists who uh, have seen people who have had strokes following yoga well, there was this one guy, one neurologist I know here in Vancouver, a guy came in who was trying to hold handstands for up to an hour. He was working his way up. Well, that's an inverted position, a lot of increase in blood pressure and all that. That is not a natural thing to do. You should not be holding these positions for long periods of time. There are advantages to yin type yoga practices for sure, but really long held positions in extreme ranges are going to lead to injury as well. So that would be another contraindication. The other thing to realize is the spectrum of yoga is huge, okay? You can give yourself a power yoga class where you're doing a lot of long-held strong positions, not at extreme end ranges. That should be pretty safe unless it gets too fatiguing for the person. And again, once we get tired, that's when our injuries are more likely to happen. So we have to watch out for that. But that's kind of my take on that. Holy man, Nikki, you, make, you got me talking on that one, okay? What do you think? Best practices. Is there, any, is there any ways that you would not work with somebody or suggest certain poses for them? Yeah, sure. So I'm a yoga therapist. Um, I, I sort of have a, a broad range of people that would come to me and, I'm, and I teach one on one for that reason. It's very difficult to teach a group class and, and, and just make sure that everyone's doing the right thing if they have some sort of an injury or a respiratory condition uh, or a digestive issue or, or a back or a joint problem. So one on one for yoga therapy for me is the way to go. Um, so, so a lot of times there'll be uh, a student that will come in uh, that might have be in the acute phase of their injury. So when they're in the acute phase, I would probably tell, say to them, uh, depending on what it is, um, you know what, first get an okay from your doctor. So as a yoga therapist, my scope begins when the doctor says yes. Um, so that's really, really important. So when they've got the yes from their doctor, um, you know, they're usually out of the acute phase and then they're into sort of the recovery phase of their injury. Um, or whatever other health conditions, circulatory condition they might have. Um, and so that's when I would start the practice with them. And then every pose can be modified. There are so many modifications. It's unbelievable. And I'll be showing you some with the beautiful flow that we had this morning. I'll be showing you modifications for every single, uh, if we have the time, for every single asana the Dr. Nick taught us this morning. Uh, so you can just see that the scope is so broad to work with any injury, back, joint, circulatory, digestive, lymphatic issues, uh, respiratory issues, anything. Yeah, so. yeah, fantastic. And I mean, the other thing you're talking specifically, Maggie, about your question about low back pain, another contraindication, and I wouldn't say contraindication, I would say precaution again, is if somebody had a spondylolisthesis. So what is that? That's a lumbar vertebrae that slides in relation to the other vertebrae because they have ligament laxity. A lot of the poses that we showed here today, you can do with good core engagement that can lead to stability and still explore them. It's when you go to those extreme end ranges. Now we had a model. Oh yeah, here's, here's a picture of her right here. For those of you who follow me on the Insta, you would have seen that I saw Amber for the first time in like 10 years and she hasn't aged at all from the covers of this picture right here. So she was our model for the muscle manual, but we didn't pick her for our yoga book because when you watch her do her upward facing dog, she literally goes, her back comes down and almost bends 90 degrees at one segment and then comes out. So I know that she has significant instability at one segment. Generally, what we want to see is a nice rounded flowing movement as much as possible into any of these. Think of your spine as a, think of your spine as a chain, basically. And you want each link in the chain to take its fair share of the load, right? Versus if you have one area where that's moving a little bit more, that area of instability is going to move every time you challenge yourself into it. So what happens is clunk, clunk, this area keeps moving, keeps moving, keeps moving, gets looser and looser and looser. And then the areas around it don't have to work as hard. And it creates a cycle of repetitive load that makes the condition worse. And that spondylolisthesis could lead to, well, the instability could lead to spondylolisthesis, osteoarthritis, 
chronic pain in that area. But the one thing that I will say, and the body is amazing to do that, so is your mind amazing to do this, your body can adapt with repeated loading. So as long as the loading is safe and they can tolerate it and it's not causing further extreme injury, you can load into it. Now, does anybody know who Ron Coleman is? He's Mr. Olympia from, I don't know, like the 90s or something like that. This guy's like 300 pounds and he squatted about 800 pounds on his back. If any of us, unless there's a huge person in this class who's incredibly strong, did this, our backs would be crushed. Our discs would explode. It would be way too much weight for us to handle. But if you give slow incremental changes, graded exercise exposure or graded yoga exposure, you can develop strength and ability into these different ranges. The problem is when people go into it too fast, too hard, too soon, that's when we can see the injuries taking place. So disc herniations that are acute. And if I have a spondyl and seats or instability, I'm usually going to turn that person down a little bit from those ranges and then maybe focus on improving mobility in areas of compensation instead. Okay. All right. Uh, but what else do we have, Meg? I've been practicing 15 years and even after incurring multiple herniated discs after experiencing two MVIs with two days, two days apart. Oh, that sucks. I personally found the benefit from practicing mindful movements post injury. So I'm confused as to where the negative comment may be coming from. Yeah. I mean, if you look in the research and the literature, you can find arguments pro and against yoga for sure. But the general trend is exactly what I was trying to show you at the very start there at the beginning of the yoga book was there's a, there's a growing body and more body that's more in support of the benefits rather than the risks associated. But to say it has no risks would be inaccurate. There are risks associated with it if you do overload tissues too much. But that's the same for anything. If you did exercise, if you did massage, that was too hard cardiovascularly on somebody who had cardiovascular weakness, that could cause cardiac arrest or other issues with them that could all lead to potential negative outcomes. So we always have to gauge it on an individualized basis. And this is where the main medical system has fallen down a little bit. It's changing in the last couple of years, but we're always trying to work towards the individual patient. Exactly what Nikki said. What is that person specifically coming in with? Do I have the doctors okay to do that? Do I feel comfortable with this? And then deciding on a treatment plan based around that. All right. But that's a great question. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I need you guys to ask because we'll understand it a lot better when we, when we do that. Okay. So now I'm going to go through some of the stuff in the yoga book here really quick for you guys. We have lots of time here. Well, actually, we don't. So I'm just going to go through a couple of key things here. So, because I want to give Nikki a lot of time to do do what she to work her magic. Okay. So, a couple of key things. We were just talking about this. This is the range of motion of your entire spine. This is from Clinical Biomechanics of the Spine by White and Punjabi. This is a text from I want to say the late 80s, but it literally is one of the foundational texts around spinal movement. What do you notice about this graph? There are general trends for flexion and extension, depending on what region, lateral flexion and rotation. The big thing to get is your lumbar spine is designed for next to no rotation, okay? The shape of the facets, if I hold this, if I stop the screen share and hold this up again, most of you know this already, but the facets mean they don't give you very much rotation. Bone actually hits, excuse me, bone actually hits bone. But if I flex forward, then I can get better rotational movements. So for a lot of these things that we're going through, like the cat cows and stuff, into a flexion position, I can maybe free up a little bit more movement for somebody. The same thing when we are going into looking at other areas of the body. Your neck is designed for most ranges of motion. It is the swivel on the top of your head that keeps you safe from the saber-toothed cat that was going to get you. And no, we weren't around when the dinosaurs were around, thankfully. I don't think we would have made it. But if you're trying to run away from one of those lines or anything like this, that would be something that your neck has to have good range of motion. And exactly what I gave you at the start is what I give most patients. The breathing exercises with the inhale up nice and tall. And then the exhale, leaning over the side to try and find some range. And then repeating that cycle two or three times. For those of you who joined me for the instrument assisted class as well, right before this one, that's going to be my go-to first is I'll often do the range of motion, do it three or four times at least, instruments come out and then we go from there. But regardless, we're trying for repetitive load to the tissue to give you better range of motion. Now, these pictures right here give you a rough idea of where you want to put pressure on your hands when you're setting up a yoga practice. For a lot of people, we especially talk about this in Hawaii, for a lot of people who do these actions, 
they find that it hurts their wrists. And usually it's because they're loading too much into their wrists. So I'm just gonna do a quick demo on this for everybody. So if you take your hands and you just put them together like this and then push your hands together and I look at the bottom of my hands, can everybody see how the center of my hands, there is no gap there. That is straight pressure on my wrists. And most people do this where their hand is bent and they push into their wrist, like uh, put the light a little bit better on the side. They push in their wrist like that. That gives all load right through the carpal tunnel, compression of the median nerve, and a lot of load on the ligaments themselves. Whenever we can, if we can spread that load out, exactly what Nikki was doing earlier, you push your fingers down first and then come lightly into your hands, you're gonna see that there's actually a space on the bottom of your palm. So if you're doing this at home, fingertips can come together. You're gonna to push those fingertips in and together like this. Then you're gonna bring the palms of your hands together, but I'm not fully dropping in like this. I'm keeping the pressure in my metacarpal phalangeal joints through the middle there. And now if you look at the bottom of my hand, you can see that little bit of space right there. That space takes pressure off of the median nerve, off of the carpal tunnel, and is probably gonna result in them being more tolerant to being in the position, should they have any wrist issues. Okay, that's a good one. I can't believe how time is flying here. Holy man, okay. All right, I've gotta to go to the next one because I wanna give her enough time. So, because I want Nikki to give you guys a good practice because she's RYT 500, authentic from the old country. It's gonna be perfect, okay? Balancing into the foot, we did this as part of our tree pose where I really focused on it. But I would suggest to you for any patient population where you have balance as an issue, this is your geriatric patients. And just so we're clear on this, your loss of ability to balance can be correlated with your life expectancy because when older people have falls, they often fracture bones. And especially if it's a lower extremity femur or something like that, that has them be laid up and not moving for a certain amount of time, they will often develop pneumonia from it. So I think the rate currently is if you are over the age of 75 and you have a femoral fracture, your likelihood of dying within a year is about 50% and you die from pneumonia because the body's not being used enough, not being moved around. So you get stasis in the lungs and a buildup of the bacteria that cause pneumonia. So balance is foundational. I would encourage you, even in your own practices, if you're treating somebody, stand on one foot and see how you do with that, okay? Even in my own practice, we have everybody take their shoes off. So I teach a lot of students. I have a few doctors who come in and see me and want feedback on their skills as well. And they can't believe how we can adjust and move people around with us in our own socks, it means you have to have good biomechanics and control to do that. All right, so this is some of the anatomy right there that I want to go through. Loops and spirals, we'll save for another day. The other key thing that I wanna talk about for sure is a fear avoidance model. Uh, this, this graph right here is just talking about repeated loading over time. I was talking about this a little bit during the practice where I basically said, if I stress a tissue and then de-stress a tissue, the first cycle, I'm gonna get a lot of benefit out of that. Second cycle a little bit more, but the trend is a point of diminishing returns as you cycle through. But the big thing that we have to be aware of is this fear avoidance model. And that's as big as I can blow it up. All right. I would take a picture of this. I would have a copy of it. I put it in every single book that I write now. It is that foundational. Even the mini books we give to our patients, those all have this in here and I hope they can find it. So a couple of key things in a fear avoidance model. What happens? I've got injury, I get pain, and we all have a choice when we get pain. And almost every human being does the choice on the left here. We all catastrophize. We think about what is the worst case scenario and how am I gonna have to deal with this? It is a safety, evolutionary safety mechanism so you can at least be ready. But the problem is people get stuck in this cycle. I have pain, that's threatening information. Now I'm catastrophizing. I'm not gonna be able to do my job. I'm not gonna be able to pick up my kids, whatever else it's gonna be. And they go into a fear of re-injury and then they go into avoidance and hypervigilance. And once they stop moving, disuse and depression and this cycle continues repetitively for that person and they get stuck here. How many of us have people who define themselves by their condition? Oh, I have bad knees, so I can't do this. Oh, I have scoliosis, so I can't do that. We need to break, oh, and one patient I had just on Friday, or sorry, just on Tuesday, yesterday, she came into one of the classrooms with us. She had just fallen. She's got plates in her neck, surgical fusion in her low back. She's only 40 years old and on disability. And she knows to break this cycle. She was stuck in it for five years. And you can hear it when somebody tells it to you because they're saying, 
if I get better, they cannot visualize future wellness. What does yoga, breathing, movement therapy allow you to do? It allows you to break this cycle. It can be one key piece of the puzzle that starts to break this process for the person and push them down, pushes them into a low fear position. Not no fear, low fear. So what is low fear? It means, yeah, there's a chance I could get hurt. Yeah, there's a chance it could be worse, but things should improve if I challenge myself. And return to activity and recovery are correlated directly. The sooner I can get you back to normal movement, the better off you're going to be. It is across the board in the literature. It doesn't matter what the condition is. If it is depression, if it is low back pain, if it is a shoulder sprain, if it is you name it, whiplash, the sooner you get back to regular activity, the better off you're going to be. And we can see that with what the person says. They're not saying if I get better and stuck over here, they're saying when I get better or more yoga specific, when I can move into this position, when I can find this pose as a balanced position for me, right? Yoga is a great way to facilitate normal activities for patients. Yoga can absolutely help. All right, the rest of the book, we just go through poses and show some variations. So I'm gonna pass this off to Miss Nikki, who's gonna show us a bunch of different things that she wants us to do. I can be her, her, her relatively stiff model and kind of take you guys, take you guys through this. We will take requests too. Maggie, you had some great questions. If anybody else has questions, please ask them and we'll show some variations right here. So I'll get this as close as I can for her right here. And we'll kind of go from this and then I'll pass it off to the amazing Nikki show right here. Namaste everyone. It's, <laughs> I wish I could say it's very nice to see you, but we can't see any of you, but it's, we can feel your wonderful energy. So thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Nikki. I, uh, like I said before, I'm a yoga therapist. I work out of my private yoga studio in Vancouver at Commercial Drive. I also teach online. Uh, you can find me at internationalyoganetwork.com. Um, don't look at my Instagram page because I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm awful at social media. It's just something I have to get better at. Uh, but my website is available for you. Um, so before we begin our asan practice, uh, we have roughly 30 minutes. Is that right, Dr. Nick? Uh, you have a little bit more than that. We have about 40 minutes. So we can okay. do some acro and other stuff too that oh, we can good. show. So yeah. So yeah. maybe like if I could take 20 minutes and take, you can take give 30. Me, yeah, take 30. Yeah, just give me like a halfway mark cue. You got it. Um, so before we start the actual asans, something that I wanted to talk about was the fear avoidance model. And I'm a huge proponent of this book. I love it. I have read tons of yoga texts, Sanskrit ones even, um, you know, uh, or traditional Indian texts. This is a beautiful book, so I'm not sure if you guys have it, if you don't get it. Um, it is funny, it is informative, it is anatom anatomy is, is technical for someone like you who has the background. Uh, so it's a beautiful book, do get that. Uh, but the fear avoidance model is talked about in, by the ancient yogis as well. And that was what, when I was reading this book, I was in South Spring Island this week and I was, uh, if for pleasure reading, I read yoga books, I was reading this book. And, and it struck me and, and I said, you know, this is it, written in the Vedas, which is the, the, the old Indian ancient sacred texts from which we got yoga, right? And so they, they talk about four emotions, dharma, jnana, aishvarya, vairagya. Dharma is the sense of duty. So when we do our asana practice, we do it with a sense of duty towards our body and our mind. And we, and we focus ourselves for whatever time we're doing, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it is. And we do it with a sense of purpose, right? And then that leads to jnana bhava. Gyan means um, knowledge, wisdom. So when we do this practice, we're learning about the body in so many ways. And we learn about how does it feel when I'm in a certain position, we become more aware. So our awareness levels go up. Um, the next emotion that the, the, the wisdom leads to is strength, ashvarya bhav. So when we're doing our practice, there's different fears like we talked about earlier. Those fears start to organically dissipate because we're working on ourselves and we're strengthening our mind and we're strengthening the body and the spirit gets stronger. So when we do our practice with the duty and we have this wisdom and awareness, then we gain that inner strength that you'll see many yogis have and many practitioners of other things like jujitsu or tai chi and other, other modalities have. And, and you can just sort of see that in this person, right? That inner strength and confidence. And the last emotion that comes up 
is um, vairagya bhav, which is the most beautiful one, according to me, is the bhav, the emotion of letting go. And that's when we let go of the fears. So just something I wanted to bring up as, as we do our practice today, you know, try to use these four emotions in every asana, in every posture. So let's begin. So Dr. Nick started us off with an uttanasana, which is a raised hands posture. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to break it down. If you're following along, wonderful. If you're not, it's totally fine because you do, you do need some bricks and you need a bolster and you need a, a, um, a belt and a blanket. So if you don't have that, just watch and you can do it on your own after. So hand to, um, hand to sky, uttanasana. So what we're doing is we're inhaling and we're taking our hands up. Now, a lot of people, what they do here is they collapse the lumbar spine. And so what the cue here for your patients is your sternum should be pulling up and imagine that there's a cord that is pulling your sternum, sternum up to the sky. So that creates a lot of space in your lumbar back, right? Now, the second thing is if your patient has knee problems, like Dr. Nick said already, ask them to bend their knees. It's totally fine. So this is a locked knee. No asan should have this. A micro bend or even a deeper bend is totally fine. And so you come into hand to sky posture. The next posture that he talked about was we fold it forward. So hastapadasan, hand to feet. So there are many ways of doing this. You can just come down, keeping a micro bend in your knees from the front. Or if you're up here, you can do utkatasan, chair pose, again, bending the knees and then coming down. So a couple of points I'll make here right off the bat. Can everybody see how graceful and smooth her movements are? That's the goal here, right? Like if you're coming through and anything feels sharp and catches you a little bit, of course, you're going to have to modify your specific positions. But that micro bend was a key one for us to get because it just takes that little bit of stress off the ligaments, doesn't keep you in a tight pack position at the knee joint. So Amanda, I know you asked about that for tight quads, painful knees and flexion. A micro bend can be there, but we'll get more into it in a little bit. All right, keep going. Nikki. So this would be a micro bend and this would be a deeper bend. And now spider fingers. I love spider fingers and I love blocks for people with injuries because it just gives you, look at the, look at the difference. So this is me in um, Uttanasana without any help, any support. Now look at what happens to my spine when I have spider fingers on a block. Look at that. Okay. Yeah. And another great variation too, like people think, oh, I've got to reach the floor, but you've got that patient who could never touch their toes. You're not going to force them into that. So give a variation on that. Absolutely. Use as many blocks as they need. It depends on the injury. Yeah. The next pose that we went into was um, downward dog, Adho Mukhishwanasan. In this one, the best cue to tell your patients, I'll move this out of the way, is first finger forward. So what that does is it just gives you a little bit of extension here so your shoulders are not internally rotating and you just externally see if you do if you just do this if you're watching this just do this and see how it it changes the the angle of your shoulders so you externally externally rotate the minute you externally rotate your hands right so your shoulders open up as well so in adho mukha when you're in this pose, someone might have a wrist injury. This is a difficult pose, guys. So what you have to do is you can either ask them to place a blanket that's not slippy. So you've got, this, this is just an Iyengar yoga blanket that I use. You can use any blanket that's sort of coarse, roll it up, and they can place the palms of their hands, first finger forward on the blanket, and up they come so much more comfortable. I, I don't even have a wrist injury and I use this all the time. Now, again, if they've got lower back pain, SI issues, ask them to do a micro bend in their knee. This is totally fine. Yeah. And that's a good point too. Like, again, she's hitting on the points of micro bends, SI issues, low back pain. If you do that micro bend, it takes the pressure. We'll just show it on the kinetic chain right here. Put your legs back straight for us, Nikki, really quick. You can see how she had to externally rotate her legs and has to hold this way harder, pushes the hips up. Then she'll do her micro bend. So she's coming in. Yeah. And then you can see the tension just drops off a little bit. I'd rather people not be in extreme tension to try and hold something, lower that tension, find your breath in the position, right? Yeah. Another common problem with this pose is people will be looking up and look at that cervical spine. Mm -hmm. That is a bad place to be and a lifelong injury if they continue their practice this way. So what you want them to do, and they'll, and you know what, you'll, keep, you'll have to keep repeating this because people find it hard to let go. Ask them to face the crown off their head, 
to the floor and gaze in between their feet on their mat. So then this happens. And now you've got a nice extension in that cervical spine. Yeah, solid. All right, so that's other focus Shwanasana. Next pose that we discussed was <clears throat> warrior one. Now warrior one can be done in so many ways. How we did it, did we do warrior one? We no, didn't. we have warrior two. We did warrior two, Let, yeah, let's, yeah. Let's, let's show you warrior one. So warrior one is basically you stand at the top of your mat, you take a step back, right? Now this heel should be in the middle of this arch. This foot is angled at 45 degrees. Bend your knee in the front, and then you come into a namaste. Now, the problem with this is if someone has um, tightness in the neck, this is not a great place to be in. So what they can do is they can just stay here, right? The other variation is if this is something that's too difficult for them, ask them to place their knee on the ground and then uncurl the toes and then make a 45 degree angle with that leg, okay? If the knee is tender, very simply, just place a blanket under the knee. And suddenly it becomes a sthidam sukham asana posture, steady and comfortable. Yeah, and that's what I would suggest for all of you. You can use a block, you could use a pillow, they could use a towel, whatever it is, anything that can take that pressure off the knee. Because especially if you're on a hardwood floor and all you have is your mat, that might be a stopping point for them not to enjoy their practice because it hurts to get down there. So a little bit, a little bit of extra padding does make a big difference. So, okay, excellent. Warrior two, very easy. You're just opening up to the long side of your mat. And so same uh, adjustment, you've got the blanket and there you go. Now, if someone has shoulder issues, they don't even need to move their arms. They can start off just here. You know, if this feels better for them, that's all they need to do. I don't know if you guys know this, um, reverse warrior position, we'll get into it since we're in the position already. And so from here, you just lean back and you inhale and you take your upper arm over your head. Now, if someone has a shoulder issue, they don't even need to do that. They can just place their palm on their waist and that's it, right? And you come back into warrior two and you go into side angle. Same thing. If someone has a shoulder issue, don't ask them to put their head, hand over their head. This is just good enough for them. And even, yeah, exactly. And the nice thing for here, we, we talk about this in jujitsu all the time too, but if you look, she's got frames set up where she's supporting her weight. Like she doesn't have to maintain this through the core. So if I can even just do this, this is you taking a knee in your football circle right here. This is a great way to take some pressure off, right? Like it doesn't have to look exactly like this. Let's just say this was too much. I would slide this elbow forward just like this and then just let them balance like that and be out of the pose but at least they're moving in a different direction. And what's huge about this, if I'm set up like this, this way I have to carry my weight. As soon as my forearm touches my front thigh, now the pressure comes off of my low back. So again, if you have low back pain, you can approach this with a different, a different angle that they might not think they could be able to do. Excellent. Keep going, Nikki, this is fantastic. Good, I hope you guys are getting stuff out of this. So now we've got, we're coming back to warrior two, we windmill, windmill our arms down, and we come into other Mukheshwanasana. And now we are going to talk about the pigeon pose that Dr. Nick was teaching us earlier. This is a beautiful pose, guys. And it's difficult, a lot. It's very difficult, especially for runners, athletes, women. We have a lot of emotions trapped here. Men do too. So how do we get into pigeon pose if we have tight hips? This is a wonderful tool. I love this thing. I sleep with it at night even. So what you do is, depending on the height that they need, you could even do a rolled towel, which I was doing earlier, or if they need a, a higher sort of height for the hips, use a bolster. And you put your knees on the bolster. If you need to, if they need to, they can place their hands on the block, all right? And then you take one leg, at a 45 degree angle, don't try to do the 90 degree thing. It's way too difficult to so start yeah, with the that, 45. That's a great point. A lot of people will try and because they see in the book how it's gotta be, oh, perfect up at 90 degrees. That is a knee wrecker if you really try and force it up. The demo, mm -hmm. the modification she's giving here is way safer for you to do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So then what you do is you bring your knee as close to the bolster as possible and, I'll and you'll see why. And then you start lowering that hip down by pulling your back leg further and further and then adjust this bolster under your hips. And now suddenly you've got this amazing support and square hips 
uncurl your toes and spider fingers on the block and you're in pigeon pose. Yeah, and everybody can see again how she's set up like this, but I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use my pointing staff right here, how she's got extra support over top of this hip so she doesn't have to drop in and carry that weight herself. I find this especially good for people who are a little bit overweight and deconditioned. This is another way to give you more buoyancy and support into a pose. So excellent variation. Yeah. Good. So same thing on the other side. I won't go into it right now, but you get the idea. So that's a great modification for pigeon pose. Um, let's talk a little bit about the mermaid pose. For some of the yogis here in our course that would like to do the mermaid pose, maybe you're starting to do it. Maybe you're already doing it. You want to try something new. Um, mermaid pose is when you're in pigeon, right? And then what happens is when we bring this leg up, this hip will start rotating laterally, right? And we don't want to do that. So we have to keep trying to push this, this hip of the bent knee towards the ground. And it's hard. It's, this, is not, this is not something you would want to give your patients. This is for yourself. So what you do is you just can- so, Just so we're clear on that, like she's in extreme internal rotation. Like these are hard positions for you to do. So yeah, but this is more advanced stuff. So great. So put a bolster next to you. And then that'll just give you that little support. Also, um, we don't have a towel, but if you have a little towel, if, the, if you get knee pain when you're doing this pose, you can roll up the towel. This is way too thick. I'm talking about like a hand towel and you put it in the joint of your knee, right? And that helps you create that space in the knee joint. And then you can use one of these straps and just bring the foot in as much as you can. You can go over top, right? If you're trying to get into mermaid, try and hook your elbow and you may not reach, your hands might not reach and that's fine, stay here. But using this bolster, using that blanket really helps. Totally, and then Amanda, you were asking about other things you can do for painful knees or weakness in knee flexion. It's the same thing, I'll grab, we have a hand towel just off the side right here. There's a couple of ways that you could use it. The first thing I might suggest to you that if somebody really has a ton of pain coming into any kind of squat movement or anything like that, I would encourage you just to have them even hold onto a door handle or something firm. I usually don't like to say a table because tables can slide. If you grab onto like the countertop, you're gonna slide too. But if they grab onto where their sink is and it's a strong sink, like a kitchen sink, if they can grab on a little bit like this and then fade back, I'm losing my body weight or lessening it because I'm using the actual counteracting force to pull me. So I'm gonna pull this bar off all the way down to here and then lift myself back up. And that little bit of extra support goes a long way. So I got this if you need it, but yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah, so this is great because any posture that your knee joint needs support with, you can actually place it. So even if you're sitting in thunderbolt pose, Vajrasan, a lot of people will complain that my knee hurts, right? So you can create some space with this. Even in lotus position, if you're, let's just do a half lotus, but if you're doing a half lotus, you place it into your knee and you create that space in your joint and it's really helpful. So use this towel for any creation of space in the knee joint, right? Okay. So Amanda, that should get your question right there. Lots of variations. Really, it winds up being a lot of experimentation too. Even little things like if you're trying to get into that squat and you turn your ankles out, turn your ankles in, that can change the way that you actually load through the tissue. Ideally, explore as many different ranges of motion as, of po as possible until you find a position of enjoyment, right? That you can get into it, that you can breathe through. So, okay. Yeah. So talking about squats, the next one, which we haven't covered so far is Malasana, which is garland pose. So in garland pose, what you do is you've got your mat and your feet are hip width apart. So I always like to start off with my students to see how, what their range of motion is. So you've got your feet right out to the sides of your mat, and then you turn your feet out just slightly, your toes. So you externally rotate your hip and, that, and your toes are, are facing about just, just, just less than 45 degrees out. Now, at this point, what you're going to do is you're going to keep your torso straight and you're going to start bending down. And a lot of people will start going down like this, right? So you've got to, you, that, that's your sure sign of, okay, tight back, tight hamstrings. So put blocks here. Take a couple of blocks. 
ask them to just and and put, make the blocks horizontal so that both the sit bones can be stable otherwise they'll be falling off on one side so you come into malasana and, and you just ask them to place their bum on the blocks and there you go so much easier so this is a great variation for malasana right if they want to make it more difficult over time they can actually place the hook their elbows into their knees or just just in front of their knees or the thigh area and then come into a namaste and then use the, the elbow as a leverage to push those thighs out. But there's a couple of good things you can see from this. Number one, she's able to relax in that position because she's basically sitting down and has good support. And then she can work on actually holding the position better. Her back, you can't quite see it from that angle. Maybe you can in the mirror actually, but quite straight, well-balanced with this position, right? A lot of people get so stuck there. They're kind of wrapped in like this and trying to force themselves into it. We're going to be far better off if we can get them straighter and a little more open into it. So excellent variations, Nikki. Tell us more. Dr. Nick, I need two more bricks. I get, I get it. I get it. I'm going to go for <laughs> Now, this is okay. too much, right? Because this is a hard, hard asana. It's a hard posture. Thank you. So what you do is you start off by getting them to sit in malasan, but then don't do the arms like that. You get them to place their fingertips and start opening up their chest and shoulders. Yeah, and I think one of the key themes we should see through all of this practice and all the class that we've been doing here is the opening of the chest. This maintains your lung capacity later into life. One of the things that I do when I'm assessing patients, a lot of the techniques I use, they're gonna take a big breath in, and then as they breathe out, I start to load on them and stretch them out and move them in different directions. Well, I can tell your lung capacity based on how that breath in and breath out is. Cause some people are literally like, take a big breath in and that's all they got. And they breathe out. That's all they have. So you know that their lung capacity is down. Maintaining better lung capacity for later in life is also a mini goal that we're making out of this as well. Excellent. Good. So that was garland pose, my lesson. The next pose is a wonderful, wonderful pose. It's called camel pose, ushtrasan. Uh, what this pose does is, I mean, it, what does it not do is the question. <laughs> it works on pretty much every organ system in the body. Um, and, and let's see why. So there are many variations for this one. And it's a difficult pose. I'm not going to lie. So try, if you're already practicing yoga, you, you probably know how to do it correctly. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to teach you starting from the easiest version, going into the traditional version, okay? So, Ushtras and Camel Pose. The simplest way to get into this is you're on all fours and tabletop, right? And you just sit down on your heels, okay? And then you take your fingertips, and thumb facing in, fingers facing out. Make sure there's space between the fingers. This is a preparatory uh, asan for ustrasan. And you lead with your sternum. And that's it. You look up. Just beautiful. Opens up the heart. Gives you that external rotation of the shoulders. Make sure that if your patients are feeling neck pain, they don't go all the way back. Or lightheadedness we know like vertebral basilar insufficiency type issues again most of the poses we're not looking for full extension they can even just bring their head back relatively straight but not letting it flop back into position is key exactly yeah. and then the next variation to make it a little bit more difficult when they've mastered this is to then come up on your knee, uh, knees in kneeling position and then you curl your toes in right and you place your thumbs so you sit back and you place your thumbs in the exact same position, fingers facing out, as close to your uh, balls of your feet as possible. And then you lift yourself up from the hips. And when you're lifting yourself up, you inhale and you try to bring those hips over the knees and open up that shoulder girdle. So people were asking earlier about contraindications. This is a great pose to open up the front of the abdomen and case. But what happens is when you have a facet syndrome, this would put a lot of pressure on your low back. So a more advanced position. The first variation she gave was great, would work good. This would be as long as everything is working well, you could push yourself up into that position. And I see the question here in the yoga book, do poses specify the muscles that are being activated? 110%, that's the purpose. We actually give you a list of every single pose, what muscles are activated, what muscles are stretched, and even the ligaments as well that you're challenging with it. So there you can see the specificity of treatment. 
you might give as a super yoga therapist or a practitioner with a person on your table. And another great um, variation is if they're not able to reach down with their arms, put a bolster behind them. And that way then it's, you're on your toes, you've got your kneeling. So it's sort of the next step, but you've got this bolster where you can have support, open up your chest and pretty much get the same benefits really, mm -hmm. uh, but much safer. Yeah. And again, even with the bad knees or something like that, this could potentially, if you put it wedged in there a little bit more, you could gap the knee joint a little bit too, take some of that pressure off potentially. Absolutely. Another thing with knee pain is use a blanket. So for many of my students, I have a blanket under the mat for the entire session, sort of midway. This is it. That's how they start. That's how they end because it just gives them that extra padding for anything that we do. Mm -hmm. Right. So that tenderness for the knee, this is a great option. Yeah, nice. All right. <clears throat> so the next one that we're going to do is a twist. And uh, Dr. Nick did this one um, in a different way. So Ardha Matsendriyasan, which is a half lord of the fish's pose. And it is a pretty basic twist, but it can become difficult based on how we do it. So I love blocks. I usually would sit on a block. I would suggest you using blocks for yourself and your patients. So have a block under your sit bones. Come into Dandasan, which is your legs facing forward, stick pose. Make sure that you're not falling off. Move the flesh out from under your bum. Yep. Get those ischial tuberosities on the, on the block. Exactly. Absolutely. And then bend the, let's just start with the right. So bend the right knee. And then I'm going to show you the full pose first, and then we'll show you the modification. So you take this knee over, and then you bend your other leg, and you bring that heel next to the bum. So the left heel is next to your right bum, right? Now, this is a difficult position to be in for someone with knee pain, tight hips. So what can you do? They can actually simply just sit like that on the block. The block will give them the elevation, and then the straight leg will take pressure off of the posterior part of the body, right? And then they don't even need to go into the full twist. So they don't need to hook their elbow. All they can do is simply place a block here, place a block at the back, raise your arm, and there you go. That's so, it. Yeah, so again, it, depending on what their range is, not forcing the action into an excessive full end range if it's too much or they're not ready or they can't breathe into it. Everything we're trying to do is make the, feel, make the person feel comfortable and encouraged to try new things so they feel safe for it. Exactly. Okay. And now if they're not even able to bend their knees, they can just sit in Dandasan and do twists. Same thing. It, the idea here is to lengthen the spine up, exhale and twist. Doesn't matter what your legs are doing, right? Another great okay. variation of this is put your legs to one side and twist in the same way. That's it, that's all the, you can do this on a chair even, yeah. right? Super easy. Yeah, and you wanna make it as easy as possible for people. So all these variations are winner, winner, chicken dinner right here, okay? All right, last one for the day, Bharadvaj Asan. It's an asan that is dedicated to Sage Bharadvaj. He was one of the, they say, the one of the first seven yogis that brought yoga to the people. So how we start off on a brick, you got your feet in Dandasan. I'll show you the full pose and then we'll do the, the modifications. So in this one, for all of the yogis in our group, you bring your one foot into Ardha Padmasan, half lotus. It's a tough one. So I wouldn't suggest this for your patients unless they're fully, you know, um, no injuries. And then this one, the other leg, the left leg, comes into Paryankasan, couch pose. Now this is a very deep knee bend. So if you're not practicing yoga, please don't try this right now. Leave your legs straight. Then what you do is you lift your right arm up if you've got your right leg bent and you do a twist and you grab hold of this toe. And this arm just simply rests on your thigh and you go into the pose. So this is the, the traditional version. Now, how can we modify this, right? That's it. All you need to do is place your leg over your leg and you're good. Yeah. So nice figure four position, same twist is going to happen. And you're just gradually trying to explore the range. Can I get around? Obviously you're not going to be able to reach around your back and get to that same point, 
but it doesn't really matter. It's can you move your body around, feel safe, get the lubrication, blood flow going, get that synovial fluid moving around, move that interstitial fluid. That's all we're looking for, for all of our movement therapies. Make it fun for your people. All right. Thank you, Ms. Nikki. Any last minute tips? Oh, no, that's it. Just do it with awareness, duty, strength, and allow your body to let go. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Let go in a safe way. All right. What do we have? Is the yoga book post business muscle being activated? Yeah. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to a share screen for the yoga book itself. So this will be a prime example right here. We're almost getting into the time where we're going to finish off with our last 30 minute flow here, but you should be looking at the yoga book right now. And I just have opened a cat cow position. So every pose in the book literally goes through the alignment for how you set yourself up. I especially like these ones that we had drawn because you can see there's that cat. Meow. There's the cow going. And you see, you think I'm goofing around. I didn't do it in my yoga flow, but sometimes I will. If I'm working with a patient and I can tell that they want to have fun, and this is going to be a good visit. I will say to them, I want you to make the animal sounds as you do it. So they'll go into their cat pose and they'll go meow and they'll have them go in their cow pose and go. Meow. And people can't help but laugh when you do that. So that's part of breaking down that wall and scaredness of, uh, or fear of trying out yoga or the movement patterns. But then we go into indications, contraindications. And under the anatomy, we say the muscles activated and the tissue stretched. So intervertebral discs, rhomboids, all of that. And then where it's applicable, I do show you graphs of, I'm trying to zoom in here just a little bit, graphs of where you would see relevant clinical information. So here it is looking at disc pressure with various positions. Cat-cow positions are actually pretty good for low disc pressure and for you to use with herniations, as long as I don't give a lot of twisting movement, movement and it doesn't cause a sharp or shooting pain. I even ghosted on these images pictures of the intervertebral discs and vertebral bodies moving in the person's low back so you could see it. And then if you look at each of the poses too, around each one in light gray, we talk about the key things for the overall positioning that you might want to do with it as well. Okay. Can I click ahead? Same thing here. You're in child's pose. I'll even have some of them have pictures where we actually show the entire anatomy of what's being stretched out. Child's pose is actually a good one for stretching out tight quads. You're asking about that. Uh, hero is okay, but child's pose is pretty good because you can get some of that, not rectus, rectus femoris, but all the other three vastus lateralis muscles will stretch out with that. Uh, what do we have here? Extended puppy. And you can tell my background is North American. So I tend to use just the North American names. You can hear Nikki talking using the Sanskrit names. It's so, it's so authentic to actually hear that. And she can bring us back to some of these, some of these ideas. So I really appreciate having her here with us. Forward fold, again, there's a picture showing the muscles that you're using, the tissue stretched, giving some variations. So we do that for all of the muscles when you're, or sorry, all the muscles, all the poses that you get people into. All right. And then I even give quizzes at the end of each chapter where we can ask you at the end, why don't you say downward dog, give me a list. Number one, can you name the pose? Number two, what are my alignment cues or key things that I want to watch out for? And then you could say, what is the tissue being stretched? What muscles are being activated? What are the indications? Do I know variations, right? All of that is available from these chapter ending quizzes. So it comes out pretty good for a lot of that stuff. And you can see relatively simple text, a lot of good variations for us to go through. Yeah, so I just wanted people to see that really quickly. Okay, I'm gonna stop my screen share. I think there's another question, super quick. Uh, any specific poses to mobilize the diaphragm? I would suggest to you, any pose, and I'll pass this off to Nikki in a second, but any pose that vol involves flexion and extension of the spine where you're moving the upper lumbar and lower thoracic spine is going to be a diaphragm mobilizer, as well as any twisting actions that you do and any inversion. So when you flip upside down, what happens? I didn't cue into it, normally I do, but when we were doing our hip thrusts at the very start or bridges, when we were at the very beginning right there, or in the middle of it, I guess I should say, or maybe closer to the end. But regardless, when I go into a position where we're set up like this, and let's say we brought ourselves up into a nice hip thrust, we stop right here. Already, I'm starting to get my abdominal contents. This all is fluid, so it's actually sliding up a little bit. It's way more flexible than people realize. If you've done a cadaver dissection and it's been fixed, you don't know what the real anatomy is like. This stuff is like sloshing around. 
You know, if you drink too much water and you go for a run, you feel it sloshing. That's what all the intestines and everything else are like. So even getting up into positions like this and then breathing through that, your diaphragm has to contract against that resistance. And then dropping your legs all the way back and in, this is even giving you more compression. Hands can drop. You can really get back and up into positions here. And in jujitsu, this is actually inversion where you'd be fighting somebody with your legs and arms at the same time and very frustrating. So you have lots of opportunity to load and move the diaphragm. But what else would you add to it, Miss Nikki? Um, that was great. All of that. I would really, really add breath work. So it's unbelievable how many people breathe incorrectly. And, you know, when a student will come into me for the first time, I'm doing their initial assessment. I've got all of their health history. The first thing I say is lie down. Let me see what you do when you inhale. And when they inhale, their belly goes down, but it's supposed to go out. You inhale and your belly goes out. Exhale, belly goes in. So the first thing to do is to teach your patients how to breathe properly. How do you do that? Pranayam is a breath work, yogic breath work, and I teach that in a lot of detail. So I'm going to show you two of them today. So what you do is you get your patient to lie down on a supine on their back and ask them to get their feet mat width distance and then bring their knees together, place one arm on their belly and the other palm can just be anywhere facing up in the sky. Now, ask them to do equal breathing. So three counts, inhale three counts, exhale. Now just watch my tummy. I, I hope you guys can see my tummy here. I'm not sure if you can, but as I inhale, the tummy will come up. Exhale, tummy goes down. So the diaphragm is doing all of this movement for you right here. What happens in North America, especially is so many of us are chest breathers. People try and lift through their chest, right? It's, that's not your goal. And that comes from a lot of stress just being built up in the shoulders and the chest region. And we're just holding on to our muscles, right? From stress that's in our mind. So when you make your patient aware of proper breath, ask them to then start incorporating that into their day. So now suddenly they're walking around and they're just aware, inhale, tummy goes out, exhale, tummy goes in, right? So this is, di it's called diaphragmatic breathing. It's a wonderful question, whoever it was that asked this. We have a pranayam that is specifically for the diaphragm. Now, this is the basic one. If you wanted to go into, so if you have a patient that's a little bit more advanced, this is a beautiful pranayam and it's called prolonged exhalation. And it's, uh, the Sanskrit name is shunyak. Shunyak means zero, which means no breath in the body. Why do we do that? Because as we exhale and we get rid of all of the air in the tummy, the inhale becomes organic and natural. Let's try it together. If you guys are, have a place to sit and sit comfortably, please do sit, try to sit on the ground. Uh, try to sit in either Vajrasan. So you're sitting on your, uh, your bum is on your heels knees are together or sit in cross leg position. That's what I'm doing. And I'm sitting on a block. All right. Keep your back straight, chin parallel to the floor. Palms can be up or down, no problem. And just take a normal breath or two. And now what we're going to do is we're going to inhale, start exhaling from the nose and exhale, take all of your breath out gently no jerky movements and once you reach the end of your exhale pull your diaphragm in and up hold your breath two three four five first release the tummy and then inhale let's do that again take a normal breath and now let's begin inhale exhale all the breath out from your body and when you reach the end of your exhale suck your tummy in pull it upwards hold your breath one two three four five first release the tummy and then inhale and this is a beautiful pranayam it's a yogic breath work for specifically for the diaphragm so i hope that answers your question Yep. Excellent. And in fact, any type, any type of breathing is going to help with that, but you can just, could everybody who did it just see how calm you were following that? 
You see a lot of research, people are always talking about vagal nerve stimulation. Well, this is direct vagus nerve parasympathetic stimulation right here that you're getting with this, right? So one of the key things that I want to suggest to you here before we get into Nikki's afternoon practice for us is what do I actually need as minimal equipment in my office to treat somebody if I'm going to use exercise rehab or kind of these movement therapies right here? So you do not need much. What do I actually keep in my office? I keep stretching straps and I have a dowel rod and otherwise I have some kettlebells and that's about it. Minimal equipment, you can do a lot with this, okay? If you're going to be more advanced and do a lot more yoga, or you see a lot of yoga practitioners, then I would suggest blocks would be of more benefit to you as well. They take up minimal space, they're relatively clean, all of that good stuff, but you don't need much equipment or anything at all to really start bringing this practice in for your patients to actually see uh, and to bring these exercises and routines that we've taken you through, through for their benefit ultimately, okay? All right, other questions on the chat? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, then I guess what we can do then is get Miss Nikki to get us through another routine here if she's okay to do that. Sure, we can practice everything we learned today in a flow style. Okay, nice. All right, tell me where you want me to be, coach. Uh, you could set up wherever you wish. Okay. That was good, where you were. Okay. And then they can get both angles, right? All right. Or I'm going to let Nikki do this and maybe I'll just take some pictures of her while she does it. She wants to get a couple of shots here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. So Nick. Have, I have yeah. no pictures of myself, guys. I, I have, I'm not on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook. I don't even have a Facebook page. So I'm a, I'm a little bit challenged when it comes to social media, but I realize if people need to find me, I need to be out there. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's begin. Do we want to have a little bit of music in the background? Totally. What do you, do you have any requests? Oh, just, just whatever you played before. Okay. So we're not going to do the modifications. We'll just run through the, all of the asanas that we learned today, just sort of take it all in and do it with a little bit of mind and breath awareness. We start at the top of our mat. Lift up your toes and place them on the ground. How much time do we have, Dr. Nick? We have exactly 31 minutes. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. So let's... Feel the connection of the soles of the feet to the ground, hands and palms are by the side. Inhale, Uttanasana, hands to sky, leading with the sternum, gently pull up your quadriceps. Feel the weight on all four corners of your feet. Exhale, start hinging at the hips. Keep your arms and your head together and as you reach your midway parallel to the floor, extend your spine forward, and then allow your torso to gently fall down towards the floor. And then release your neck, crown to the mat, gaze between your feet, watching the back of your mat, just in the middle. Gently raise your quadriceps here, Make sure that you're not squishing your toes or scrunching your toes. That's something we do. It's a sign of stress. This is a wonderful posture to figure out which parts of your body are tight. So do a run through, scan your face. Are you holding on to your jaw? If you are, bring space between your teeth. On the next exhale, relax your shoulders. Exhale, relax the back. And now inhale, come to halfway point. Bring your fingertips to your toes and look gently forward. Next pose is downward dog, Adho Mukha Svanasana. Spider fingers or palms on the floor. Take your right leg back, full extension, making sure that your left knee doesn't go past your toes. Coming up to spider fingers to elongate that back. And now focus on the back heel of your right leg and push it out and feel the stretch in your quadriceps. Feel your, your leg expanding, lengthening. And place that right knee down. Unhook your toes. Let's do half monkey pose, Ardha Hanumanasan. So your fingers stay where they are. You're just going to bring your hips back, straighten that left leg, and then flex that foot 
and it's called flointing, flexing and pointing. So you're flexing your foot, but then you're trying to point the mounds of your, your toes, the balls of your feet. It's a, it's a skill. <laughs> It'll come. Keep trying. Flex the foot and point the balls of your feet forward and see how much that lengthens your calves. Inhale, bring your hips forward. Exhale, going back, lifting that front foot off the floor. We're just opening up the body a little bit before we get into our deeper twists and things. Inhale forward. Exhale back. Inhale, come back to center. Place your palms on the floor. First finger forward, remember, and curl the back toes and come into Adho Mukha Svanasana, downward facing dog. Inhale, take your right leg. If you need to, you can hold on to the ankle and step it forward. If you need that support, it's totally fine. And come onto your spider fingers, horse riding pose, Ashva Sanchalanasan. Again, pressing that heel back, that left heel back. And from Ashva Sanchalanasan, we're going to come into Warrior One, Vir Virbhadrasan One. So how do we do that? All we do is we lift our torso up. When you're feeling stable, arms come up from the sides and in namaste. If you're someone who has tension in the neck and shoulders, you don't need to come in namaste, just stay here. I'm going to do the namaste version. Place that back heel down, foot is at a 45 degree angle. Warrior two, just open up to the side, keeping that chest open, reverse warrior, bring your back hand to your back leg and your front arm just goes over your head, palm facing the sky, keep that front knee bent. I know it's hard guys, but keep going. And side angle pose, Pashva Konasan, keeping the front arm, palm facing up on your front thigh and the other arm goes over the head, gazes forward. Keep pushing that outer edge of your back foot into the mat for extra stability. And come back into warrior two, windmill those arms down. We're going back into downward dog. And now you've, your bodies are nice and warm. So see if you can, once you're in downward dog, make sure that your all your, your weight is equally distributed in your hands and your feet and also equally distributed in all four corners of the hands and the feet. And if you're feeling good, if you're feeling open, then try and bring your torso closer to your thighs on an exhale and then drop your head. Just hang out here. Feel the strength of this pose. And on the exhale, bring your knees down, come back, walk back with your hands, open up your knees. We're halfway through, let's get into a resting pose. Walk your hands forward, chest to the ground, forehead to the mat, and just rest here. Notice if you're holding on to your shoulders, exhale, and allow the shoulders to fall towards the mat. Next, focus on your hips and your pelvic region. Exhale, release your hips to the ground. Inhale, come back up on all fours. Bring those knees back into hip width distance and come back into downward dog, Adho Mukha Svanasana. First finger forward and pressing those heels into the mat. Now take your left leg and bring it to the middle of the mat and take your right leg, push it up towards the sky and come into pigeon pose, 45 degree angle and walk that back leg back so that your hips are square. Remember all the modifications, feel free to use blocks and bricks and blankets and bolsters. 
spider arms and walk forward, reclined pigeon and rest here, forehead to the floor. Inhale up, Vipreeta Kapotasan, revolved pigeon. If you've got your right knee bent, take your left elbow, put it on the floor, raise your right arm up and see if you can bend this arm and you can either just leave it on your waist or you can try and reach your ankle or you could try and reach your toes. Now, if you're flexible and you've reached your toes, notice that your right hip has probably come off the floor. So square those hips again, place that hip on the floor and then look up over your right shoulder. Exhale, twist a little bit more pushing your shoulder away from the floor. Inhale very gently, very slowly, coming back into traditional Kapotasan, pigeon pose. Place your fingers down, your palms on the floor, first fingers facing forward, come back into Adho Mukha Svanasan. And walk your hands in, Slight bend in the knee if you need to, and hang out here in forward fold. Now your body's nice and warm, so we can go further, so you can hold on to your ankles, and you can lead with your sternum. So hinge at your hips, hip, ball, and socket joint, your sit bones, hinge there, and see how that creates an expansion in your hamstrings. Feel that skin of your hamstring stretch as you do this. It's really cool. And once you've reached a comfortable stretch, a joyful stretch, I love how Dr. Nick said that earlier. Joyful, then, joyful discomfort. Joyful discomfort, <laughs> that's right. That's even better actually. Um, <laughs> bring your crown to your floor. Crown faces the mat. Your gaze is in between your feet in the middle of your mat. If you can, you can also place your palms under your feet so that your big toes and your toes are at the wrist and your fingers are facing your heels and then start bending your elbows and lead with your sternum and hinge from the sit bones and try to come even deeper. And then once you're here, you're now in the final position, allow your head to fall gently and controlled. And this is Vairagya Bhav, the emotion of letting go. If you're dizzy, please come out of the pose slowly and gently. Otherwise, stay here. Normal breathing. All right. Inhale. Come back to flat back. So midway, spider fingers. Come start walking forward back into Adho Mukha Svanasana. And now bring your left leg forward. We're going to do the other side. So I'm going to turn around. Left leg forward. Place that right knee down. Uncurl the toes. Half monkey pose. Inhale. Go back with your hips. Floint that left foot. Exhale. Hips forward. Keeping that back lengthened. Sternum always reaching forward. Heart always open. Inhale back, exhale forward, inhale back, and exhale forward, come back to center, place your palms on the floor, come back into Adho Mukha Svanasana. We're going into the warrior series on the other side. So this time left leg forward, you can use your hand to bring your ankle forward if you need to and drop that back heel on the floor. Now this should be sort of like this heel needs to be in the middle of that back foot arch. So that's the correct stance. Now, once you're here, bring your torso up and first find stability just here. Press the outer edge of your back foot into the ground. If you need to lift the toes of your front feet, place them back down. And once you feel the stability, that's when we raise the arms up. Inhale, arms go up. Virabhadrasan one. Exhale, open to the long side of your mat. Virabhadrasan two. 
Inhale, back palm goes to the leg, but don't collapse on that leg. And front palm goes over the head. Side, this is uh, Vipreet Virbhadrasan, reverse warrior. And inhale, come back to center and bring your left palm on your thigh. And right arm goes over the head, side angle pose, Parsva Konasan. Now this one, we tend to drop the shoulder. So open up that shoulder and make sure that this, there's space here in your shoulder and heart region. Inhale back to center and windmill your arms down, back to downward dog. I'm sure everyone's feeling nice and warm. This is the perfect time to get into pigeon pose. Inhale, left leg comes forward. And then walk this right leg back. Make sure your hips are square. Spider fingers, tall spine. Exhale, walk forward into reclined pigeon. Once again, exhale, relax those shoulders into the floor. On the next exhale, relax your hips and pelvic region into the floor. Observe the parts of the body that you keep tightening. This is a very, very important part of your practice to figure out what parts of the body do I hold? Where do I carry my stress? And every time you're in an asana, just release that consciously with an exhale breath. Inhale, walk back to Kapotasana, traditional pigeon. Let's do reverse pigeon. So if your left knee is bent, you place your right forearm on the ground in front of you. Take your left arm up and then you can place it on your waist or you can try and hold on to your ankle or your toe and then bring that left hip back on the ground. And then look up, look up at the sky. Even in a position like this, there is a possibility for spinal extension. So lead with your sternum forward and see the difference in this asana, how it creates space in the spine. Inhale, come back to center. First finger forward, come back into downward dog. Walk your arms in, stay in your forward fold. Lift those quadriceps up, hinge at the sit bone, hold on to your ankles or place your palms under your feet, whatever you prefer, and gently lead the sternum down to the floor, keeping your back lengthened. And then when you reach the final pose, gently drop your head. Inhale, bring your arms to your ears. Head and arms come up together all the way up to the sky, hands to sky pose. Exhale and release. Let's finish off with Malasan and a couple of twists. So stand with your feet mat width apart. Turn out your feet gently, just a little bit less than 45 degrees. If you need blocks, place blocks under you. And inhale and sit back down, keeping your torso straight. Hook your elbows into your thighs and just hang out here. You can close your eyes if you wish. This is a beautiful asana for women, also for men, but for, and, I, and I'm saying women first because it brings fresh blood to the reproductive organs, the ovaries. And it's just a wonderful hip opener to bring out all this deep rooted emotions that we hold in our body. Take a few breaths here. If you want to intensify it, push your elbows into your thighs. Coming out of the pose now, bring your hands to the floor. Using your palms, push the floor, exhale, come up and make your feet parallel. Walk forward, bring your knees down to the ground, come into tabletop, and then bring your bum to the ground, sit on your side, extend your legs forward. 
take the flesh out from under your bone from your bum so you're sitting on your sit bones and a really good way to find the sit bones you can teach your your patients this is to do a hip walk so just do a hip walk forward and back and and you can really feel where you should be sitting because a lot of people confuse the the, the coccyx with the sit bones right so this is a really fun exercise and it really shows you where the sit bones are so back into dandasan stick pose Take your right leg in and then over your left leg. So your foot is next to your left thigh. Bend your left leg, bring your left heel close to the bum. Make sure both of your sit bones are on the ground. Take your right hand back, spider fingers behind you. Left arm goes up, inhale, exhale. Hook that left elbow onto your right thigh. Your arm can stay up or you can just simply place your palm on your thigh. Exhale and twist. You can look just to the side or gently over your right shoulder. Inhale, lengthen your spine up. Exhale, twist. On the next inhale, first, bring your head back to center and then your torso. And then straighten your legs. Let's do the other side. Once again, make sure you're sitting on your sit bones. Bring your left leg in. Place it over the right thigh. Bend this right thigh. Bring your right heel close to your left bum. Left arm goes back, spider fingers. Inhale, right arm up. Exhale, twist. And bring your elbow to your thigh. Inhale, lengthen your spine. Exhale, twist some more. You can gently look over your shoulder or just out to the side. Staying here, normal breathing. Inhale, bring your head back to center. Unravel your torso. Extend your legs forward. And we finish off with an asan, which is called yoga mudra. If you have a block, sit on a block. If you have tight hips, if you're um, an intermediate practitioner, just do a cross leg version. So sit in easy pose, sukhasan. If you're an advanced practitioner, do a full lotus. And we finish off with a forward bend, a bend for gratitude for our practice today. Thank you for being here, everyone. Take your right hand, hold your left wrist, bring it as far up your back as you can. Exhale, lead with that sternum, keep your back long and come forward and stop as soon as you feel your back rounding. You do not have to come down to the floor. Just stay where the back feels, round, feels long. And once you're there, exhale and relax those shoulders down. And just breathe here. If your sit bones are off the floor, you've gone too far. So adjust your position. And just stay here and enjoy the benefits of this pose. A small prayer of gratitude. May all beings be happy. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings flourish. Gently inhale and bring your torso up to center. And as we finish off our practice, Dr. Nick and I thank you for being here. Namaste. All right. Thank you all very much. So two lovely practices. You're seeing a male-female yin and yang balance. All of that good stuff. Hopefully you've got lots of good information that you can apply directly into practice. That will at least help some of your patients in the future. And I want to thank you all very much. If there are any last minute questions, please toss them up. We're also going to lift Nikki up here for a uh, one acro quick pose for her, for our Instagram picture for the day. And we'll see what we can get. But I've also put a link out there for everybody as well. The NHPSC Association put it up, but I also put the link there. If you would like to join us in Hawaii, it can count for credits. It is a approved activity. 
And it is a great way to write off a trip to Hawaii in February when we're all stuck in the bad weather and the uh, poor landscape that we're dealing with. So escape out trips. The cost is relatively low right now for flights. I couldn't believe it, it was like 400 bucks return or something like this. So just wow. crazy. All right, so I'll show you one other variation here. Miss Nikki, you haven't done any of this stuff Never before. Never done this, guys. First time ever. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is we're going to take your mic and we're going to put it behind you. So you can keep it on. Just, yeah, they can keep that this on. thing? Yeah, that thing can go. Yeah, just the I'm base like, can this go. Thing? Yeah. <laughs> it can go right behind you. And so this is one of the big things I'll often do in Hawaii as well is do a lot of the uh, movement therapy and get people to do this. A lot of you will think you can't do this. But yes, you can. What I cannot do is hook this to the back of my pants. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Yeah. So she's going to stand in front of me right here. So you're going to come and stand in front. I'm going to put my heels onto oh your boy. iliac crests. Okay. So I'm basically on her ASISs right on the inguinal ligaments. Now, if at any time you don't feel safe, you let me know right away. And we can, go, we can go ahead and put you back down. Okay, she's nervous, I can tell. No, already. no, not nervous. Okay, no, no. so her hands can come in and we're gonna do, you don't wanna interlock fingers. So just bring your hands a little bit closer. If we interlock fingers and she tried to break loose from this, it would take an extra long time and maybe I grip too hard. So we do what we're gonna call crab grip. So uh -huh. crab hands reach in like this. If you are the base and you're gonna lift somebody up, you need to bring them close. So come on in, come on in, come on in. So I bring her to like this when she's right over top of me. She's actually holding most of the weight. I'm not doing anything here. I'm going to push up with my legs and you're going to spread your legs wide. So just, like in a V? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So I'm going to bring her close to me, come in a little bit closer. And then I'm going to lift her up and push her up into that position. right Oh, there. this yeah. is fun. You're doing good. But even just relax your legs down just a little bit, flex your hips a bit more. Yeah, right about there. So I'm going to try and push you up. If it's too much, let me know. But you want to keep the strength in your arms. Yeah, wanna... arms are, your palms are sweaty. So that's what's the, that, everything else is great. It's just yeah. the sweaty palms it's right hot, now. It is hot in here. Okay, you don't realize it. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to have you do is straighten your arms out because you can get even higher. Uh, not in front of me, but like you're doing a push up. So push ah. yourself up. There you go. And then keep your legs spread nice and wide. Nice. And I'm going to take both of your <laughs> hands into my one hand. So a couple of other things that we can do here. I'll take both of her hands. Bring her forward just a little bit more. Now she's in better balance because I can actually focus it. You can feel the shake is gone because yeah. your body weight is over top of you better. Yeah. And then from here, we're going to let you just forward fold. So you're going to bend down, dropping down, 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 down. And you're just going to let yourself hang. You're okay. Just let yourself hang like this. So she can reach in. Both of your hands can go just bend your elbows if you want. Yep. Behind your back. Nice. And I'm just going to push up and give her a nice stretch through like this where we can kind of Spin her to the side a little bit. Spin her nice to the side opening. a little bit. So all of this is available, but just kind of an idea. Hands can come back out. We can make palmer contact again. So you're going to go ahead and bring your hands forward. So we're both you're going to put them underneath you like a push up, all the way through, and then push up nice and strong. I'm going to bend my knees and bring her back to the ground. Okay. And then how do I get out? This is the hardest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you just basically <laughs> let them go nice and light, just Yay. like that. Okay. All right, so any questions, any comments? That's her first time doing it. When yeah. you have a good guide, you can get through this stuff. And ideally we'd have a spotter there, but I was pretty sure I could handle her, so that was okay. All right, let me just see what I have for questions here. It's gonna be like 28 degrees in here right now, I swear. Hot yoga. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, it's like 27. <laughs> All right, how can poses be modified for the trapeze I see behind. Yes, that is a whole nother separate class right there. One of my favorite things to do, basically is spinal decompression is what you'll do, but we'll have to save that for a future event right there. The yoga trapeze are fantastic and they're not that expensive. They can hold a bunch of weights. So they're pretty good. But yeah, we'll talk more about that in another one. All right, that's what I have for everyone. Well, thank you very much, Leslie. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. And thank you again to the amazing Nikki for helping us out today. Super cool just to have her involved and we'll see you at an in-person seminar in the future. All right. Toodles. Bye Namaste. everybody.